Ready, everyone? Yeah. Good morning. I'd like to call this meeting to order. Um, we're here for the November meeting of the California Law Revision Commission. Uh, it's our third live stream meeting, so welcome to those of you who may be viewing us on the internet. Uh, we have four new commissioners today, um, and we're very glad to have them join us so that we have a fairly full house today so that we can all get to know one another. Why don't we introduce ourselves, and um, starting from my far left. What city? What city, uh, what city you and, and what do you do? Uh, I, I live here in Sacramento. Uh, I am recently retired for the second time. Uh, I work here in the Capitol as a legislative staff person for uh, 35 to 40 years. Uh, I work for nine different centers, mainly in areas of um, public education, school finance, a um, little bit of claims with constitutional and uh, budgetary matters. This is my second commission. I'm, I'm also currently a member of the Commission on Judicial Proceedings. So I'm the guy that judges the Supreme Court. <laughs> <laughs> um, Diane Boyerbein, I'm the Legislative Council of California. I've been here for 30 years. I'm the Legislative Council of Brian and Brian. Uh, Richard Rubin, I'm new attorney, just retired in January. Clients are delighted. Much of my background, I'm from the great county of Oregon, some of you probably know. And uh, then most of my background in Washington, D.C., as a legislative assistant to a couple of U.S. senators. Migrated to this wonderful state 44 years ago. Jane McAllister, um, I'm an attorney in practice in Modesto. I've been an attorney since 1988. This is my um, second term as the commissioner with the California Law Revision Commission. Very happy to be back. I'm Brian Hebert. I'm the executive director. Um, my voice is much louder than theirs because I have the microphone turned on. And that's actually an important point to make because for introductions, it's fine. But for the live stream, this is the source of the audio. Um, so when we're actually uh, deliberating, let's be sure to turn the mics on when we speak. Um, I. I uh, have worked for the commission since 1996. It was my first legal job after law school. So, and I think I've been the director for 10 years, something like that. Um, new commissioners, if you ever need anything, contact me. I'm Victor King, I'm the uh, chair. Oh, this is my eighth year on the commission. I'm from Los Angeles and I'm the general counsel of California State University, Los Angeles. When Victor said eight years, I thought, wow, I guess so. Um, it's been eight years because we came on together um, and this is, but it's my third term. My name is Crystal Miller O'Brien. I'm from Los Angeles and um, I'm happy to be here and I'm vice chair. So <laughs> you kind of inherited me. Okay. Good morning. My name is Anna Kubas. I'm a new commissioner. It's an honor to be here. I am from Los Angeles and am an adjunct professor at East LA College and also a lecturer at Cal State LA. Morning everyone, David Carrillo, new guy. Uh, I work at UC Berkeley Law School. Uh, I'm the executive director of the California Constitution Center. Pleasure to be here. Good morning, Kristen Burford, staff counsel uh, for the new commissioners. If you have any paperwork to turn in, I'm your person this morning. Um, and I'll be here all day. <laughs> I'm Barbara Gall. I'm the Chief Deputy Counsel. I've been with the Commission more than 25 years now. Um, and welcome to everybody who's new. Thank you, everyone. We're going to march through the agenda now, but if for the, especially the new commissioners, if you have any questions or concerns at any time, feel free just to flag me down and we can certainly uh, review whatever questions you have. Um, starting with the agenda, uh, item number one, the minutes. The draft minutes are attached to Memorandum 2019-53. Uh, the staff does not have any revisions to recommend, so it's up to the commission whether to approve them with or without changes. I don't hear a motion on the minutes. So moved. Second. Any discussion, amendments, edits, concerns? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Any abstentions? No. 
Okay, uh, agenda number number two, uh, the report of the executive director. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm gonna take a few minutes just to sort of speak generally about the commission since we have so many new members. Um, I have had a chance to talk with each of you individually and provide you with some background materials, but I thought it might be helpful to talk a little bit more about sort of the, the character of our work and what to expect in this meeting today. Um, a, a few years ago, I was doing some research on the background of the commission and I came on a, a 1950 report that was submitted to the legislature when they were cre considering creating the Law Revision Commission uh, by Ralph Kleps, who's uh, Diane's predecessor, twice, twice removed, many times removed, um, Legislative Council in 1950. And um, he had in his report a sort of simple taxonomy of the kind of work he thought that a Law Revision Commission might do for the state. And I, and I, I thought it was helpful, it helped me to think about how to talk about the kinds of projects that we do. Um, and he drew a major distinction between uh, technical work and substantive work. And by technical work, he meant work that doesn't change outcomes. So it's about improving the expression and organization of the law without altering the substantive effect of the law. And a lot of the work that we do falls into that basket. So for example, on today's agenda, you're gonna be looking at um, finalizing a proposed recodification of the California Public Records Act. Uh, when that work was assigned to us, the legislature directed that we not change the substantive effect of that law. So that's a purely technical recodification. Um, another project that's in that same vein is the, the work that's go ongoing to recodify certain portions of the law on uh, toxic substance cleanups. Um, that. Kristen Burford has been doing. Um, the other large basket is substantive. Uh, and uh, Mr. Kleps divided that into two categories. Uh, one he called mechanical substantive and the other he called policy substantive. And mechanical substantive changes the outcome of the law. You know, the results will change. But it's not about making new policy, it's about uh, perfecting existing policy because the, the legislature's already decided on a broad policy, but the law that effectuates is, is imperfect. It's become obsolete. It's uh, uh, in conflict with changed circumstances. There were drafting errors, that kind of thing. So uh, we will do a, a hard look at um, those kinds of problems and figure out what changes are need, needed to bring the law into perfection in order to effectuate the already established policy. Um, an example on today's agenda of that is the, the memo that I'll be presenting in a moment on a follow-up study we were assigned to do on the revocable transfer on death deed, where the legislature already broke the policy ground of approving the existence of that instrument, um, but they wanted someone to take a look at whether it needed changes in order to work properly. Um, and then the third category is the policy substantive, where the, the purpose of the work is to create entirely new policy. Um, and an example of that is the work that was done back in, I think, 2005, when the legislature asked the commission to consider whether a revocable transfer on death deed should be authorized in California for use in transferring property on death. Um, they didn't yet know whether, they, whether it would make sense for California to have that kind of an estate planning instrument. They asked the commission to evaluate it, look at the law of other states, and to figure out how to effectuate it so that you know, we anticipate problems and address them up front. Um, the commission's work tilts pretty heavily towards the technical end of that spectrum. A lot of the assignments we get are technical. Um, and right now on today's agenda, most of the work is technical. Um, and one thing I wanted to say about that is that when we're doing technical work, necessarily there aren't any policy questions to be decided. The, the issues that come up are technical issues, like how, what is the best way to organize a, a body of law? 
um, where should provisions be located? How should they be expressed? How can you say them more clearly without changing their effect? That kind of thing. And that kind of work often leans really heavily on the staff. Uh, it's drafting. And that's where our expertise is, is in drafting those kinds of cleanup bills. It doesn't often require much of the commission in these meetings. Um, and at prior meetings, the commission has directed the staff to use uh, consent practices uh, to the extent that it's appropriate, modeled after consent procedures used by the legislature, where um, if a, a decision needs to be made, but it's presumptively sound, we presume that you would be okay with it, we'll identify it expressly as a consent matter. And then at the meeting, we may we may ask for a general vote on a, a whole slate of consent matters, or we may just indicate that we're not gonna bring it up and unless somebody raises objections, we'll presume that it's approved. Um, and that kind of practice is most appropriate at the technical end of the spectrum of the kind of work that we do. Because as I said, the commission's function there is not so much to be making decisions about policy, because there aren't any policy decisions. It's more to act as a check on the work that the staff has done to make sure that we've done it well, that, it, that there aren't errors, and that you know, in terms of optimizing the presentation and, uh, of the law, um, the approach we've taken is the best one. Um, so it's certainly appropriate, and it's not unheard of for commissioners to, to raise objections at, uh, to staff work of that type, uh, but we usually don't walk you through all the details. You know, if you look at, for example, the memo, the, the memos that Kristen's presented on the toxic material, very dense, very technical. None of us have expertise in that subject matter. Um, it's very hard for us to to judge the the merits of the drafting, but. If you have something, or if the public has something, and we rely heavily on the public in those kinds of studies, then we can make adjustments. But often we will presume consent for the materials. Um, presumed consent is less common as you move towards the substantive policy end of the types of work that the commission does. Um, sometimes there are purely technical issues that pop up in those kinds of studies, and we might presume consent on a case-by-case -case basis, but usually w when we're more dealing with the substance and changing outcomes, we will ask the commission uh, to deliberate and make decisions on the possible different approaches we could take. Um, I just wanted to walk through that and sort of explain uh, the propriety of using consent practices for purely technical matters, and also to let you know that if you ever think that we are overusing a consent practice, the remedy is to tell us and to raise a concern at the meeting itself. And we're always prepared to talk about any of the materials we present in the memo. It's just a question of how we're gonna present it. Um, does any commissioner have any questions about the process generally? or anything I've just said? Okay, so at, at today's meeting, what uh, we're gonna do generally is what the- I just might yeah. add that uh, usually because of the Brown Act, the Bagley-Keene Bagley 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 Act, that we don't, generally when we meet here, that that's our first time and opportunity to discuss matters. So uh, usually when we prepare for the meetings or the commissioners are preparing, we will write notes so that we can bring them up and then it's our first opportunity to kind of hear other people's ideas and thoughts about things. Yep, I appreciate that. And the only thing I would add to that is that uh, the Open Meeting Act is a prohibition on the members of the commission talking amongst themselves in a group large enough to constitute a quorum um, about the business of the commission. But it doesn't prohibit individual commissioners from talking to staff. And so if you ever have questions about anything we've prepared for a meeting, feel free to contact us directly, so long as that doesn't serve as a conduit for creating a serial communication between members of the commission constituting a quorum. A question for Mr. Simpson. 
Yeah, just a quick question. I was looking at the, the little um, binder with the procedures and policies of the commission. Mm -hmm. and the, the, the one thing that struck me as um, curious was um, uh, once, a, well, once a quorum is established, um, my, matters can be approved by a majority of those present and voting, but it also says that um, for final recommendations, you can do the same thing and at least three commissioners have to approve it, which <laughs> that a final recommendation wouldn't have to be approved by a quorum of the body that was and I don't know why that well the quorum is necessary for the Commission to be able to act correct but in terms of, if it was a majority of a quorum and our quorum is five what well, would still be three um, you'd still need three affirmative I get, votes I get that I'm just um, and maybe it's because I grew up in this building um, to take final action on a measure in the legislature, you have to have a majority of the body to to approve it, and this only requires a majority of those present and voting. I mean, one of the reasons for the I'm just curious the unusual character of our quorum rules, and they are a little unusual because we're a ten-member body. Right. Our quorum is five, right. not six, and. Uh, with respect to our legislative members, uh, part of what's affected our quorum practice is the impracticality for the legislative members to routinely attend meetings. Or vote, probably. Um, and you'll see, you know, we have a member from the Senate, Senator Roth, we, Assembly Member Chow is a member, neither are able to be here today. So if, if we required six votes uh, as a majority of the body, um, We'd often be unable to achieve that. That wasn't that wasn't my question. My my, my I, I I understand the legislative members and this and the separation okay. of powers. My, my only question was why isn't it five votes to approve a final recommendation as opposed to um, at least three? Is that a, a, a quorum is five? Yeah, that, that would be a quorum of the membership. Yeah, yeah. No, no, that that, was that my would be a question. majority of the membership. Right. Um, I don't recall, Brian, if this occurred. Because we, the CCUSL wrote their quorum requirements by the prior director of this um, body in a similar fashion. Because that there was a time period during one administration where we, for the entire tenure of that mem that governor, which was shorter than it might have otherwise <laughs> been, um, we didn't ever have a full commission. Correct. We so this may vacancies. have been we had a significant number of vacancies for the so entire term. Vacancies. So this may have been written in relation to that. I don't know. It would have helped. Uh, you know, we we weren't even sure if we were going to have how many members we were going to have for this meeting. So if we would have had an, a quantity requirement, we, we could have never had this meeting. I mean, every time there's a transition between governors, we have a, a quorum problem because at least governors of the same party, as a matter of comedy, will clear the decks. Um, and so, for example, we had a commissioner who was appointed by Governor Brown, but not yet confirmed by the Senate, whose appointment was withdrawn after the election. Um, uh, I, I think the rules have developed out of practical concerns about attendance and achieving the minimum number that we need. Okay. Uh, we're obviously in great shape today. Yeah, no, just, just curious. Um, yeah. And just so the new commissioners know, uh, Jane McAllister and I were reappointed, so uh, we're serving uh, at the start of our new terms. Uh, Ms. Miller O'Brien uh, was appointed two years ago, reappointed two years ago. So um, the other thing I was going to talk about is a little more specific, and but it also involves some general information that I want to share with the new members, if I haven't already, um, which is that this year, as part of the state budget and uh, trailer bill, um, the governor and the legislature assigned a new function to the commission. So the commission as an entity is now going to be administratively responsible for two multi-member policy-making bodies. This commission, uh, which for convenience I'm going to call the civil commission, even though we have sometimes touched criminal statutes, um, is going to continue its work um, unchanged. 
But we're also, on January 1, we're gonna have uh, a new committee, the Committee on the Revision of the Penal Code, which I'm gonna call the Criminal Committee to differentiate the two bodies. Um, though by, yes? Oh, okay, by statute, those bodies are non-overlapping. You, you cannot be a member of both. And not also non-overlapping in terms of authority. The actions of the committee do not need to be sanctioned by this commission. Um, we have, this is an, a new development. Um, it's, it's going to have repercussions on our staffing. We, as part of the proposal, we were authorized to hire two new attorneys and we're in process of doing that. Um, and so we'll have some differentiation between the staff. Um, in fact, uh, Mr. Cohen will, uh, it, at some point be transitioning over to the criminal side. And so uh, enjoy his presence today because you may not see him again. Um, but, and then uh, Barbara Gall, who's the chief deputy counsel and myself will continue to have overall responsibility for the, for the agency staff as a whole. And so we will be splitting our time between the two functions and doing administrative and legal work in support of both of them. I'm not exactly sure how that's gonna work out, but for now, um, we're gonna be burning the candle at both ends a little bit for a while. Um, but one of the wrinkles that comes out of this I wanted to raise today, uh, which is that you know the commission has um, a handbook of practices and procedures that should have been provided to all the new commissioners. That is this memorialization of all the commission's decisions and descriptions of its existing practices, uh, which are recorded as sort of a, a tool for understanding our institutional practice, but it's not immutable, it can change. The, all these things are subject to uh, modification at any time or waiver. Um, one of the provisions in the handbook uh, section 210 says in part that the appointment, promotion, or involuntary termination of staff counsel shall first be approved by the chairperson. Um, commission approval is not required. So I can't hire or fire attorneys without the chair's consent. Um, I would ask for a modification of that rule uh, with respect to attorneys who are going to work exclusively for the penal committee. Uh, so we're involved in this hiring right now for an attorney for who's going to be the principal staff attorney for that committee. The, the chair of that committee has been appointed and he and I are working closely together on the recruitment process. He's going to be involved directly in the recruitment process. I would ask that you assent to a waiver of this rule or perhaps even a modification of it so that it only applies to attorneys who are gonna be assigned to support this body. And that attorneys who are gonna be assigned exclusively to work for the penal committee, uh, appointments, promotions, or terminations would be approved by the chair of that committee. Does that make sense? Any concerns about that? Okay, so I'll take that as unanimous assent, uh, which will lead me to the last point I'm gonna make um, Can I ask you? Yes. As a point of information only, how does the staff go about the process of prioritizing the issues which we will see each time we are here giving consideration to them? Okay. Um, it, uh, it, case by case is the best that I can say. It depends on um, the character of the work and the, the timing of the work. So for example, in today's agenda, well, let me back up. When we work on a, on a study topic, that work is incremental and it's, the process is iterative. So we will have a meeting where we're gonna address certain matters uh, that have to be decided for the study to proceed and make progress. Um, the commission will make decisions in, and then the staff will effectuate those decisions in the interval between this meeting and the next. Um, and our priority is to make progress on existing studies um, with an eye on any long-term deadlines. So if, if a matter is uh, not close to 
completion, not, not able to be completed in time for legislation next year, then that's going to be a lower priority than matters that are viable for legislation next year. Uh, I think my question goes to the uh, point of wondering, do we in fact receive guidance from the legislature with regard to those issues that are going to be taken up, or is this entirely within our own discretion? Okay, and from meeting to meeting, it's our own discretion. Uh, we have little or no contact with the legislature on how this process goes. Um, they're hands off. Um, in terms of what we work on, if that's sort of what you're, you're pointing towards with your question, yes. um, we can only work on matters that have been authorized by the legislature. By statute, that's the case. Um, they can authorize it by res uh, statute or concurrent resolution at any time. Um, and there's also a process that's written into our governing statute whereby we annually review what we call our calendar of topics, um, which are grant, specific grants of authority aggregated into a list, um, and decide what we want to have on there. And we're required by statute to get that approved by the legislature at least once per session, so at least once every two years. Sometimes we've done it annually if we wanted to make a change. So we bring them proposed language for that calendar of topics. They decide whether they're comfortable with it. They sometimes will, I've never seen them turn us down, I don't think. If, if the commission said we'd like authority to work on something, I think it's always been granted. Uh, that may be in part because the commission has a good sense of the kinds of things the legislature uh, sees as appropriate for commission work. So we've never really asked for anything outlandish. Um, the, the legislature will sometimes insert matters into that list that we didn't ask for um, on their own initiative. The Public Records Act study came to us in that way. It was the Assembly Judiciary Committee. It was their idea that we do that work. We had our resolution before the legislature. They said, oh, there's a vehicle, and they amended it to put in that, that assignment. Um, so sometimes we get direct assignments, and in terms of priorities, we give those matters the highest priority. If the legislature said, do this specifically, this is a mandate, not a grant, it's a mandate. And especially if they put a time limit on it, then that makes it a higher priority. If we ask for authority and they grant it, that's still a priority matter, but it's lower than if they directed us to do it. I would just add, and oftentimes, depending on how controversial the topic is, we'll go back to that resolution because they might have framed it in a way that is more limiting than just a general study. I think that was true with the mediation confidentiality work we did. We have innate authority under our statute to study um, technical matters and minor substantive matters. We have a broad grant. Beyond that, we have no authority except that which is granted to us. So if the resolution, well, uh, there are other statutory, well. It, well that, I mean, we have no, no authority except what's granted to us. Some of the grants of authority are very broad, like authority to study the evidence code or right. to study probate law or right. things like that. And those tend to be one class of grants that are in the, cal uh, in the calendar of topics are those kinds of things. They're historical grants for areas we had a, done a lot of work in where the legislature wants us to retain broad flexibility to address anything within a broad area of law, probate, real property and personal property, uh, family law, evidence. Those are all matters the commission has done massive work on, and they're happy to grant us authority to do anything in those areas. Um, sometimes there's narrower grants that we've asked for because the a commissioner or a member of the public has suggested a topic and the commission decided, yes, let's ask for authority to work on that, and they'll grant it. And then sometimes it's directed. Um, the legislature decides, we want you to do this. We're putting it into either your calendar resolution or a separate statute or resolution. I think my, my question goes to the... Uh wanting to understand as well as possible the subject matter that comes to us from the legislature, which is initiated by the legislature, and I understand that. And when it comes to the, this commission, 
which is then reviewed by staff prior to its introduction to the members of the commission. Presumably you have some ability to determine which of those subjects are gonna be brought forward sooner than others? Is that a possibility? Um, that, well, the staff does exercise some discretion in terms of setting the calendar or the agenda for each meeting. So we're exercising some ju judgment about how to manage the workflow. But the commission also has an annual process, which you new commissioners just missed. Uh, it was at the last meeting. It's usually in the last quarter of the year where there will be a memo that's presented to the commission called new topics and priorities. And that will be a recapitulation of our existing work and our existing authority and also a, an aggregation and summary analysis of new suggestions that we've received, uh, often from the public, unsolicited, sometimes from individual commissioners. Um, and we'll, we'll present all of those new suggestions, um, analyze them briefly. We'll talk about the existing work and where it is in the process flow. Um, and then we'll ask the commission, set the priorities for the next year. And that's where you, the commission decides which of these things are we gonna work on in the coming year and with what priority. And in prior years, um, probably for the last 15 years or so, most of the work that the commission has been working on came from the legislature as direct assignments, often with deadlines. Um, and so it was very rare that that annual priority setting process really create, had any flexibility in it, any scope for the commission to decide, yes, let's do something more than what the legislature has asked us to do because our plate was full. Um, the last couple of years, it's been loosening up a little bit because some very long-term projects have been wrapping up. Thank you, that, that's helpful. Okay. I, I would just encourage that, I mean, if you had a topic or if you know that there's an interest in something that you know that the maybe legal community is dealing with or the public, then you can write a memo. We, I think all of us have suggested something at some point. And then as we do uh, delve into the studies, if there's an issue that kind of, you know, evolves out of where a question from a commissioner where we have, we pose it to the staff to look further, that's pretty typical. So the, the staff, they have more than enough on their plates, but it's usually because the, the commission kind of directs it or even, you know, like people, members of the community or a bar association will also raise a, a really good question and, and we'll, you know, direct the staff. Can you please look into that? I'd like to hear more about that. and. Sometimes it solicits uh, other visitors or stakeholders to come to the next meeting so that we can deal with it. So you're, you're active and you actually have, you, you know, you have a lot of discretion and authority too to kind of manage what the priorities are. Mm -hmm. Brian, anything else on the report of executive director? No, not unless any other commissioner has a question. The next section we added a couple of years ago, it's an opportunity for commissioners to uh, have a discussion of any new proposals. They want to have the commission potentially study and uh, even discussing commission procedures or other general matters, housekeeping matters and whatnot. Do I hear any commissioners having suggestions or comments? Seeing none, let me move on to the next item, uh, the 2019-2020 annual report, memorandum 54. <coughs> that's, uh, <coughs> that's mine. Uh, good morning, everyone. So the commission is required by statute to prepare a report each year, which describes the uh, work it's done in the prior calendar year and its expected work in the subsequent year. Uh, and this is attached to this memorandum as a draft of that annual report for your consideration. Uh, much, much of the report each year is um, recurring text describes commission procedure. Um, and I won't go through that unless anyone has any questions. Uh, the report also has some appendices. Uh, I've attached one appendix, which is your biographies, uh, because we have uh, many new members, and I'll ask for uh, any <coughs> questions about that in just a second. Uh, the other appendices are pretty much purely administrative. There's our governing statute, there's our calendar of topics, um, 
legislative action that's been taken historically on all our recommendations, and then uh, sort of a table of contents of all our bound volumes, which I understand each of you have received a copy of, these thick blue books that we get. And that annual report each year appears in that book as well. So um, going through uh, the draft here, uh, I guess I can start with the appendix, with the biographies. Um, as is indicated in the, in the brief memo, uh, the way we do this typically is we start with the biography in the uh, press release from the governor when you're appointed. Uh, we then essentially format the biography so they all appear to be uh, similarly put together. And then from there, we make modifications or updates as are needed. So I can ask right now, everyone has had a chance to review their biography in the appendix. Does anyone have any modifications or updates? Yes, yes? okay. Commissioner Miller O'Brien. Um, I think you just try to see if I'm looking. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go ahead and just uh, uh, leave this for you and I'll give it to you on the break, okay? Okay, is that, that's, I'm sure that that's, I'm sure that that's fine. Uh, typically we just ask for it to be submitted and then we can incorporate it. And for the record, Ms. O'Brien, uh, Miller O'Brien only has changes to her own biography. Yeah, right. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that would be, yes, thank you. Uh, all right. So, uh, moving on from that, um, the, the annual report itself has some shaded text, and this is customary. Um, the shaded material basically relates to decisions that need to be made or will be made at this meeting for the most part. Uh, it has to do with, and you can see this on pages 3 through 5 and 11 through 13. The report contains a section that talks about what the recommendations will be to the next year's legislature. In other words, reports that we finalized and we're going to attempt to have legislation introduced to implement those recommendations. And then there's the next section talks about the activities that are planned for the following year. So if we have, for example, a study that we're working on that is almost finished, there's a question and we will decide that question on some of these studies at today's meeting as to whether that recommendation will be finalized and then would be submitted to the legislature next year or whether there would be continued study on, this, on that matter the following year. Uh, some of the shaded material here does not need to be shaded anymore. Um, you'll see on page three, um, one of the studies that are that's shaded in the section that says recommendations to the 2020 legislature is disposition of a state without administration, colon liability. Uh, this was a matter that uh, had been on the agenda for today but was withdrawn. It was in a position where theoretically uh, we might have finalized a recommendation in this study, uh, but we got sufficient comment too late in the period to be able to adequately uh, address it for the commission. And so that matter has been withdrawn from the agenda, uh, which means that it will not be a recommendation to the 2020 legislature because that study has not yet been completed. Uh, and similarly, the, the study right underneath it that's shaded that says non-probate transfers, uh, colon liability of a surviving spouse under probate code sections 13550 and 13551. That's a recommendation that actually has been finalized at some point earlier in the year, but it's a very uh, specific and narrow point, and the thinking was that we might ask the legislature to introduce a bill that would contain both that recommended legislation as well as what was going, what would be in the disposition of the state recommendation. And so because we have not finalized the disposition of the state without administration recommendation, uh, we also will not be submitting legislation on that second, the non-probate transfers matter. So both of those uh, shaded items should be deleted uh, from this draft annual report, absent some objection, and the, there's a duplicate of this. The, the, the beginning of the annual report is the, basically a summary. So um, these also appear on page 10, in the middle of page 10. Um, no, excuse me, they're actually at the top. Um, questions, comments, any, anyone have anything to ask about that? 
All right. There's also um, so so because uh, the disposition of a state without administration study will continue uh, next year. It's also shaded on page four and again uh, on page 11 and page 12 as being possibly a study that the commission was going to study in uh, 2020 and now uh, it will be studied. So the shading should be removed and that should just be listed as a study <coughs> the commission will work on in 2020. Uh, one other a bit of shading which doesn't need to be addressed right now. <laughs> Sorry, this is purely administrative stuff, and hopefully we'll have more interesting material later. Uh, there is a material. There is a study listed on uh, page. Uh, let's see, page eleven, the last study listed on page eleven, and also on page four. This is a study relating to state and local agency access to customer information from communication service providers. This is a study that the commission um, has begun to work on periodically, but the last time it worked on it was quite some time ago. Uh, <coughs> pending to the extent we have time to work on it, we will be working on it in 2020. Uh, that was unclear at the time that the draft report was sent to you, uh, but the shading should also be removed with regard to that uh, item because that's a potential candidate for work in, in 2020. Where's that listed? So we're, we're it's in uh, two places, page four, the very last uh, study listed uh, in shading. State and local agency access to customer information from communication service providers and that same study is also identified. Okay, sure. So the remaining shading, uh, <laughs> taking you back to page three, is um, the next study which is on the agenda this morning, revocable transfer, revocable transfer on death deeds follow-up study, uh, assuming that recommendation is finalized, then the shading would be removed from that study because that would also be a recommendation of the 2020 legislature. And the same is true with the next two, the California Public Records Act. There's two, we have two recommendations which are on the agenda and the same thing would be true here. So, um, and that would take, that should take care of all the shading in the, uh, in the draft, I will need to wait to see what the decisions are about those about those studies, um, and I will I will try to ask at the conclusion of that discussion if there's an opportunity uh, whether it's okay to modify the draft report to do whatever is appropriate based on the commission's decision. Uh, but I guess I would ask now, Uh, assuming that the, if the commission does in fact approve final recommendations in those studies today, is it all right with the commission if I remove the shading from those recommendations in, the, in this report? All right, so I'm gonna ask. objection? Okay, I'm gonna ask. All right, so I'll just, I'll just finish up with this. We're, we're mostly done here. Let's see. <clears throat> All right, almost at the end. If we turn to page 29 of the draft, near the top, you will see a, a section entitled Other Commissioner and Staff Activities. We uh, customarily report on activities of the staff or any commissioner uh, over the previous calendar year that in some way relates to the activities of the commission. Uh, we don't often have anything from commissioners, um, but occasionally there is something. Um, if anyone has such an activity, then they should report it to us if there's some question about an activity that they've engaged in. And I actually, I, I don't know whether 
activities that any of the new commissioners have been engaged in would be appropriate to be listed or not. Is there is yeah, there are any. Right. I wouldn't think time. so because right. <laughs> All right. But if there if anyone has anything then that can be submitted. Uh, and that's that's voluntary. Um, we're just highlighting commission related activities, but you know, if it's de minimis or you just don't care to have it mentioned, that's fine too. All right. And uh, then finally, I will just ask whether anyone has any um, editorial suggestions or comments or questions or anything else about the report in general. All right. Uh, seeing none. Seeing none. Uh, this is technically a final report. Uh, so we do need a vote and an approval. So this will be our first opportunity to. Okay, do have a motion for approval of the annual report to be modified uh, in concordance with what Mr. Cohen has outlined and with the decisions of the board with regard to the studies that are listed on today's agenda. So moved. Second. All those who approve say aye. Aye. Any ups, uh, opposition? No abstentions. Okay. Thank you very much. Turning next to the uh, memorandum 55, the revocable transfer on death deed study. Yeah, thank you. That's mine. Um, let me, before I jump into the substance of that, talk about a couple of procedural points. Um, one is uh, the voting practice. Um, the, a recent change to the Open Meeting Act requires us to record votes in our minutes um, with specific information about how every member voted. We used to just report the results of the vote, um, but since then we've been reporting individual votes. Um, and our practice has been in the minutes to state generally that I votes are presumed, nay votes, abstentions, absences are specifically listed. So if there were n no dissension and no absences, it'll just say that it was approved and that means unanimously. Um, sometimes, especially on very informal points, um, like when I asked for permission to have the chair of the penal committee approve the hiring of an attorney rather than the chair of the civil commission, I just asked for your general assent um, that kind of informal guidance doesn't always warrant a motion and a formal vote, especially if it's the, the views are unanimous. And I presume in that situation that there aren't any no votes or abstentions. But if you feel like you want to vote no or abstain, speak up uh, because we will record it. Uh, just on a secondary point, I don't think it's necessary to come back to the, the shading issue in the report because the decision was that the report will be conformed to whatever we do later today and we'll just make sure that happens. Brian, the other point for the new commissioners is that change in law also requires the commission to note if you're not in the room right. when the vote is taken. And we do our best, whoever the attorney is who's presenting the material does their best to record when somebody has stepped out. But um, we don't always uh, catch it. So, you know, if you are expecting to be out for a while for a phone call or something, you might informally pass us a note or let us know or something. Um, okay, so memorandum 2019-55 and its first supplement have to do with the revocable transfer on death deed. And I guess I'm going to make one more process point. Um, that's the, I think that's the kind of meeting this is today. So to be more express about what we're doing uh, so the new commissioners can, can see the underlying practice. Um, part of the Open Meeting Act is that anyone can attend our meetings without identifying themselves. Um, we pass around a sign-in sheet for the audience, but it expressly says that signing is optional. You don't have to sign in order to attend. And so we never sort of shouldn't presume that if somebody's in the audience that they want to be identified, even if we know who they are. Um, but in this instance, I did notice that Mason Brawley has signed the sign-in sheet, which I take as a cent for me to identify him. He is here today as a representative of Texcom which is a long-standing shorthand for the executive committee of the trusts and estates section of 
what used to be the State Bar and is now the California Lawyers Association, um, the entity that was split off from the bar to uh, provide a, a home for the sections. Um, Texcom has uh, for decades mm -hmm. been in a very helpful partner to the commission in providing practical input on our work on estate, <laughs> estate planning projects. Um, and uh, Texcom has submitted a letter to us on our proposal, which is the subject of the first supplement to this memo. And Mason, if you want to, you could jo join us up here at the witness table so that it's easier for you to make any statement you want to make or answer any questions the commissioners have for you. Um, Pick any chair, I think there's plenty of room. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think so. Great, thank you. Um, so a little bit of history before we get into the decisions that have to be made today. As I mentioned earlier, um, the revocable transfer on death deed was enacted on the commission's recommendation. Back in, I believe it was 2005, an assembly member, uh, Chuck DeVore, uh, had a constituent who came to him with uh, the idea, based on law in other states, that California ought to allow people to use a simple deed uh, to transfer their property on death. Um, so you would fill out this form, record it, and when you died, the deed would operate outside of probate to transfer title to the property to your, to your heirs, your designated beneficiaries. Um, the, I think the chief purpose of it was as a probate avoidance device to make it easier for people to transfer ownership of their home uh, after they die. And, and for many people, especially in California, it's common to be house rich but cash poor. Um, you've been living in the same house for 30 years, 40 years, 50 years. It's now worth a lot of money, but you, you yourself are maybe on a pension. You're an elderly person, you have limited means, but you've got this really valuable asset. You want to be sure that it goes to your children, but you don't have enough money necessarily to hire an attorney to set up a trust or other kind of uh, more sophisticated estate plan. And that's really the only asset of significance that you have. So taking care of that takes care of your, your estate plan. Um, so Mr. DeVore proposed that. He introduced a bill to authorize it based, I believe, on the statute from Arizona. Um, and the Assembly Judiciary Committee had concerns. The, the statute was pretty general. It didn't take care of a lot of uh, potential problems that could arise. And so they, instead of approving his bill, they converted it into a study bill for the commission. And that's not uncommon. Um, we've wound up with projects in that way before where someone has a good idea, the, the legislature's not willing to say no flatly, but they think it needs further development. So they refer it to the commission and direct us to study it. Um, and that took place in 2006. We made a recommendation um, that proposed the creation of the revocable transfer on death deed um, and fleshed out a fairly comprehensive statutory treatment of it to try and take care of all the foreseeable issues. Uh, that work was done principally by our former director, Nat Sterling, who had been involved with the recodification of the probate code and had done probate-related studies for decades. And so he sort of had a, a good innate sense of what are the complexities involved in any kind of at-death transfer. And so he was able to anticipate them and propose statutory language to address them. Um, the, Mr. DeVore then took our recommendation and introduced uh, legislation to implement it, passed out of the assembly, went to the Senate Judiciary Committee where it died. Um, the Senate Judiciary Committee had serious concerns about the policy merits of allowing use of a revocable transfer on death deed, centered primarily around the fact that these were going to be uh, the part, a large part of the justification for them was that they were going to be used by lay people as self-help without the advice of counsel. And if you're going to be transferring an extremely valuable asset, there's too high a risk either of a mistake that's going to result in um, defeating their intentions or fraud and undue influence, especially concern about 
uh, seniors, you know, who, who may be vulnerable to influence or trickery. Um, and somebody would wind up stealing their house and this device would be an easy way for them to do it. Um, I think part of the reason for that concern was that the, the deed being uh, a deed was to some extent private. Um, unlike a will where you have to have witnesses, um, the deed just had to be notarized and eventually recorded. So yes, it's in the public record, but most people don't scrutinize the county recorder's records for whether or not there's an instrument affecting their parents' house. Uh, so you could sort of do it outside of any kind of scrutiny. And I think that was the, the main reason people were worried that it might be a, a device for fraud or undue influence. Um, so it died in the Senate Judiciary. Um, it was a two-year bill, so it took two years to die. It was reintroduced the next year by Mr. DeVore and died in the Senate Judiciary Committee. Um, there was a, a brief gap before Assemblymember Wagner introduced it and it died in the Senate Judiciary Committee. And always with the same kind of analysis that they were not convinced that the risk of fraud, um, they, they were concerned that the risk of fraud outweighed the benefit of allowing people this simplified process. Um, the, in the process of dying, <laughs> the bill went through a lot of amendments too. Uh, the legislature took what the commission had proposed and substantially constrained it. Um, one of the most important things that they did was they limited it to a statutory form. As the commission originally recommended it, there was a, a permissive statutory form that people could use, but it wasn't mandatory. People could draft their own instruments. Um, and the legislature saw that, I, I think with some merit, as creating a significant risk of mistake. If you can draft your own instruments, you can mess it up as you're not a lawyer. Um, and so they said, no, mandatory form. They also made the form vanilla. You cannot, there's not a lot of options on that form. You specify your property, you specify the beneficiary or beneficiaries. They take in equal shares. No contingencies, no provision for alternative beneficiaries if one of them predeceases you, just very simple. Um, so it's really only useful for people whose uh, estate needs are very simple, but that's a lot of people. You might be an elderly person, you only have one living relative, you want them to get the house, you could use this deed and it's very simple. Um, they also uh, added a lengthy frequently asked questions to the form uh, that addresses a lot of issues in as simple a language as possible, consistent with the law, to help people understand what the deed is, what it does, how to execute one, how to avoid problems. Um, notwithstanding that simplification and constraining of the thing to make it as error-proof as possible, it, it wasn't enough to persuade the Senate that it ought to be enacted. Um, Years later, Assembly Member Gatto, this was in 2015, I believe, um, reintroduced the bill based on the failed earlier bill. So he incorporated all the, legis all the amendments the legislature had made. Um, and he was an estate planning attorney. Uh, he was very interested in it. He knew about the, uh, the, the authorization of the RTOD deed in Arizona and thought it was problem free. Um, and he pushed hard and he was successful. He, he got approval by the Senate Committee on Judiciary uh, in part by further constraining the deed. Um, most significantly for our purposes, it was sunsetted, meaning they added a self repeal provision that unless that is modified or repealed, uh, the, the entire statute is gonna go away on January 1, 2021. Um, they also assigned this commission the task of doing a follow-up study to evaluate um, how the deed has been operating, what kinds of problems have arisen, whether there are further changes to the statute that should be made to address problems or improve its operation. 
And that study is due next January 1, 2020. The timing is such that the legislature will have time to introduce a bill next year um, based on our recommendation if they want to preserve the continuing operation of the statute. So they can enact our bill to preempt the operation of the sunset. Um, they also did some other tightening. They constrained the kinds of property that can be transferred um, in ways that uh, I sort of understand what they're getting at. They introduced, I think, some technical problems with the language, but they mostly restricted it to residential property. That was the, the overall gist of it. So in the last couple of years, we've been conducting this study. From the very beginning, we recognized that our ability to look for problems was going to be um, problematic because of the timing. Uh, we only had a few years to do this study after the enactment of the statute. And so we're trying to find problems with instruments that don't operate until death. Uh, so the statute authorizes them, someone has to execute one and then die, and then problems have to arise and ideally be litigated. Um, and that's just not realistic in a four year span. So one of the proposals that the commission approved at the September meeting was to recommend that the sunset and study be extended by 10 years to give us a more substantial period of time to evaluate experience under the statute. Um, and let me talk just the last point about the history. Um, and this is also instructive about the procedure. When the commission is work, <coughs> working, on a, working on a study, um, it considers memos, staff memos that help present issues and walk through decision points. And when those memos have covered all of the issues that need to be addressed, the commission approves something called a tentative recommendation, which is uh, formally very similar to a final recommendation, except that it's expressly tentative. And it provides a comment deadline for public review and comments. So it's, it's designed as an interim expression of where the commission is on the issue um, for the public to evaluate and comment on. And then we consider those comments and decide what to do in a final recommendation. Um, at the September meeting, we were evaluating comments on the tentative recommendation. The commission made a number of decisions and directed us to bring back a final recommendation. So there's a draft of a final recommendation that's attached to memorandum 2019-55. And that, subject to any changes that you make today, if you approve it, that's what's gonna go to the legislature and be our report for this study that was assigned to us. And it also, as with most of our recommendations, includes proposed legislation. So we've identified a number of changes that we think would improve the statute and including, as I said, an extension of the sunset date. So the main decision you're making in this study today is uh, approving this document for submission to the legislature and the governor. Um, the secondary decisions have to do with the content whether or not you're content with the draft as submitted or you want to make changes. Um, the timing here was a little compressed uh, because of the statutory deadline for submission. And in response to the comments on the tentative recommendation, the commission made some fairly significant changes at the September meeting um, that had never been on the table before. Um, and never, the, the stakeholder communities have never had a chance to really comment on it, uh, except to the extent that they might have uh, participated at the last meeting. And I, I think the timing was that, such that Texcom wouldn't, had, didn't have an opportunity to meet, to formalize a position, come to that meeting. Um, so the commission uh, in that September meeting expressly decided that it wanted to solicit further comment on the changes that were approved in September to make sure we heard from stakeholders if they had any concerns about it uh, before approving the final recommendation. And we got a letter from Texcom and they did have concerns about it. Um, so 
There are a number of technical points in the main memo and in the supplement, but some of those are contingent on larger issues. And if you decide the larger issues a certain way, then we never have to get to the technical points. So rather than just moving through the material in the order in which it's presented, I'd like to step back out and ask some larger questions. And um, these are, uh, I think, more policy questions than technical ones. Um, as I said, one of the main concerns that has been consistently expressed both by the legislature, by TEXCOM, by the Land Title Association, by the Judges Association, everyone who's weighed in on the merits of the revocable transfer on death deed, one of the main concerns has always been the risk of fraud and undue influence. Uh, we looked at that as part of this study and we looked at the case law in other states that have authorized this kind of instrument and there is fraud and undue influence, but we didn't find that it was occurring at an unusual rate with these, or none of the cases we found suggested that it was the revocable transfer on death deed itself that was responsible for the fraud. It was more that kind of instrument was one of the arrows in the quiver used by the defrauding person. You know, they also might have used a power of attorney or a will or a trust. Um, so we didn't find any evidence of unique vulnerability. We didn't find these RTOD deeds are especially vulnerable to fraud or particularly suited to it. Um, we might find that if we have more time to conduct the study, but we haven't found it yet. Um, nonetheless, mindful of the concern, we also looked specifically to see whether there are ways to uh, bolster the defenses against fraud. And in particular, at the last meeting, um, we considered a proposal that was in the tentative recommendation that would add a new requirement to, the, to existing law that a beneficiary of an RTOD deed, before they acquire title after the transferor's death, give notice to the decedent's heirs. So the property owner dies, I'm about to take this property under the RTOD deed, I have to notify the heirs that this is going on. And we borrowed this concept from the trust law because under the trust law, when a trust operates on the death of the trustor, the trustee has to give notice to heirs. And the purpose seemed plain. You want to alert people who have an interest in the decedent's property, potentially, that it's about to be disposed of. And if you have any problems with that, you need to speak up. Um, and so that proposal was in the tentative recommendation. Um, part of the commentary that we got from, from both Texcom and the judges was that it might not make sense to um, put the fraud protection at the tail end of the process. That there, it might be better, and the judges in particular made this point, that it might be better if the fraud protection operated at the inception of the RTOD deed. Um, and that got the staff thinking like, well, what would that look like? And right under existing law, the only fraud protection that happens when the deed is executed is notarization. And notarization is helpful, but really limited. The notary's duty is to confirm the identity of the person who's executing the deed and their acknowledgement of the instrument, right? You are who you say you are is about all that a notary does. They look at your ID, they take a thumbprint, and they sign. Um, so we looked instead at witnessing as a possible requirement. Um, and we looked to the law of wills as a potential model. Uh, this was something the commission considered when it was first studying the RTOD deed in 2006. Um, and the commission concluded that notarization was more consistent with the formalities of deed execution. And the fact that this document was eventually gonna be recorded and it made sense to sort of model after that. But we had second thoughts and we thought perhaps witnessing would be better for a number of reasons. One is, with witnessing, you have to have two people who are both there at the same time who watch you sign. So it'd be a little bit harder. Um, you know, a, a notary is a, they're a clerk. They're doing a ministerial act. It's not their responsibility to assess whether or not the person who's signing the document is free from coercion and has capacity. That is not the function of a notary. 
Um, witnesses maybe would be concerned with that. If they're being asked to sign that, yes, this person is, is signing their will, they would understand that they ought to be a little bit worried about whether the person's being coerced or lacks the capacity <coughs> to uh, express their intentions. Um, the other thing about witnessing, there's also a built-in rule that if the beneficiary of the will, if a divisee of a will is a witness, they're presumed to be disqualified, that the will, the gifts to them are presumed to be the product of undue influence and fraud. So we could borrow that. Um, and then finally, witnesses to a will can be called as witnesses in a contest to provide testimony on the questions of capacity and fraud and undue influence. I don't think you could do that with a notary. Uh, I mean, maybe you could call them as a witness, but I don't know that they would have the uh, capacity to provide that kind of testimony. And the, the ability of witnesses to testify to that is express and statutory. Um, so we thought, well, maybe witnessing would be a better protection at the front end than notarization. And that's what the commission decided in September, was to swap out notarization prospectively, not retroactively, um, swap it out for witnessing. Um, the other thing that the commission decided in September was to further strengthen its proposal on the back end that beneficiaries give notice to heirs by also requiring that the notice be published in a newspaper of general circulation in the county in which the property is located. Uh, we were talking and had discussed the difficulty that beneficiaries would have identifying a decedent's heirs. The concept of heir is a legal concept, it's statutory. Um, and it also could be complicated based on the sort of the family situation of a decedent. And it might be hard to figure out who is an heir that I have to give notice to. And rather than tighten the rules for that and risk invalidating an RTOD deed because a beneficiary makes an innocent mistake, the commission thought to install a backstop in addition to the notice to heirs of publication. So even if you miss an heir, there's more of a chance that interested persons are gonna find out about this. So the commission decided in September, let's do that too. Uh, this draft reflects those decisions. Witnessing has been put in in place of notarization, and the notice to heirs by the beneficiary has been supplemented with a publication requirement. Texcom thinks that we went too far. Um, their comments on the tentative recommendation were that we were going too far, even by adding the beneficiary notice rule which uh, then was a supplement to notarization. You Texcom objected to that and suggested that the commission not do that <laughs> because of the operational burden and cost it would put on beneficiaries. This is supposed to be a simple process that doesn't involve lawyers. For people of limited means, why make the person who gets the property make a legal judgment about the the decedent's heirs and provide, serve notices and fill out affidavits, et cetera. Um, and so the, at that time, they were advising the commission not to do notice. Um, now they feel uh, that witnessing is also ill-advised because of the burden it imposes on the, on the transferor when they're executing the deed. That's discussed in the memo. Um, but they're especially, they say we tip the balance by adding the publication requirement, which they think is unduly costly um, and of limited efficacy, the, which I, I sort of sympathize. Um, not, not a lot of lay people study legal notices in the, in the newspaper. Um, there are professionals who do that. Um, you know, because their work requires them to keep an eye on that kind of thing. But uh, most lay people who might have an interest in the property because their relative has died and the deed's about to operate probably aren't scanning the legal notices. <coughs> so before getting into some of the specific concerns that they raised, I thought it would be helpful for the commission to have a general discussion of 
how much fraud prevention is too much fraud prevention. Um, and you know, I was talking about this uh, informally with Kristen Burford and, and she said, it's a Goldilocks problem. And I said, yeah, that's right. Um, the, you know, you want to be sure that these things are protected from fraud, but you don't want to make them so complicated that people can't do it right or are deterred from doing it or it causes other just problems um, associated with the complexity. So as I said in the memo, um, it's conceivable that we could back out any or all of those protections um, and we have a much fuller representation here today than we did in September. I think we were down to just a few commissioners when they, we voted on this. Uh, so I thought it might be helpful to have an overarching discussion of w how much protection the commission wants to uh, impose. Um, I think the, the landscape is as I've described it, this is a problem the legislature cares about, fraud and in undue influence. Um, they are worried about it. And so anything we can do to minimize it, I think is generally going to be helpful in their eyes. But on the other hand, the added burden is not, um, is not trivial. Um, I would say that the burden from witnessing strikes me as minimal. Um, you just have to get two competent adults. Um, the notice to heirs is f somewhat burdensome. We had to put language in there about how do you determine who the heirs are? What is the sanction that you suffer if you ignore the requirement? How do we attest to satisfaction of the requirements sufficient for uh, title insurers to be able to rely on that? Uh, that the, this process has been followed and title is good. So there was a cluster of legal problems around notice giving. Um, and then publication has all of those problems plus the ones that Texcom has just raised, which is added costs. They said that, and I'm, I don't have any reason to doubt this, but I'm a little bit surprised. Uh, they said that they, they've encountered legal publication notice publication costs of $1,000. Um, and that wouldn't be trivial for a person who, you know, I, uh, they may live in poverty, but their, their deceased relative had a house for their entire life and they want to be able to live there. And now they got to come up with $1,000 to pay for an ad. The thousand dollars, because I'm thinking the penny saver, the LA Times, it just doesn't cost that much. Um, so typically when we're publishing in a paper of general circulation, um, it's some will have a cost per inch or it, it's you know, measured on the amount of text. Others have a flat rate. Um, I'm in Merced County um, and I, I want to say publication ranges, you know, a few hundred dollars, maybe $300 in, in, in the local paper there. Because I, I did one, it was like $80 a week. And so I'm just like trying to understand and get my head around right. your, you know, text comps. Because I always respect what you guys have to share. Right. But I just, that I'm was, trying to understand. So that, so that $1,000, you know. Um, maybe with an attorney writing the public, the notice? No, no, that was, that was one of the members had expressed that that was the fee. And I forget which county um, that he mentioned that in. Um, I mean, it depends, like LA County, it might cost, like what the, for the LA Times, and actually you would know, Brian, when you do the uh, publications for even commissioner notices, I mean, how much are you spending on that? Um, the only thing that we pay for advertisements for is hiring. Um, and no, no, when you do the notices like, oh, Victor King has been... Uh, Those are just yeah. press releases. Yeah. We don't pay for ads. Those don't go out in the newspaper. Yeah. But, but I did just... I did just buy ads for attorney for hiring, um, but I did it in specialized publications. So Daily Journal, one inch, seven hundred dollars. Yeah, and, and we do it That's for the Daily Uniform Journal. Law Commission meetings. Um, now we're just doing it in the Capital Morning Report, but we were over five hundred, if not close to a thousand. But it was also specialized. Yeah. yeah, since you have to publish in a, a publication of general circulation, you're really at the mercy of of whoever or whatever publication is in that county. And I understand from Merced County, it's not cheap. Um, so in LA, you might have a number of options, but if you're in a smaller county or it, 
it just it would be very very subjective a variable thing yeah but then i'll just ask the commission though too that we weigh the expense because and i was kind of just thinking there's this great documentary and i don't know if you guys have seen it but it shows how an entire family just got completely demolished you know because they were all fighting over like a fifteen thousand dollar home eight hundred dollars in light of years of fighting it, i just i don't think it's an investment that it, you know i think the benefit outweighs the cost and i just and just for the and i'm sure i always share too much but um, I just finished uh, my own two-year fraud uh, challenge, con will challenge, because if I, I call it cancer brain, where um, my ex signed away pretty much everything. So I, I do understand, um, and I have like, I'm pretty conservative on the protections against fraud because of that reason. And then I think Victor kind of references too, I was in, um, because I have some Persian clients down south in, in LA and I watch people hide and because that, that's something that is common in Iran, but for um, here, trying to help to identify the properties and then deal with will contests too for that, um, it, people do get creative and I think this, pro that's again, it makes me very conservative over, it's gonna be difficult for me to change my mind on this part unless it's like, so, my questions come from that kind of vantage point, just so you know. Sure. Okay. So, so just to understand, uh, if Texcom doesn't like the uh, notice to heirs publication and witnesses, your the default is just plain notarization, correct? That's the default. You know, I, I, I think that Brian sort of hit it on the head um, when he said that this is a uh, Goldilocks problem. Uh, you know, I mean, I, I think that there's, there's this concern, you know, about um, fraud and about, um, you know, trickery or, you know, having a mistake. Um, and, but there's also, um, you know, so, so we want to have all these protections in there, right? But the more protections we add, the more, the more layers that we add to this, you know, process, the further we get away from a simple non-probate transfer. And you in some ways lose the effectiveness of the tool, you know, and, and um, speaking for myself, you know, I practice in Merced um, and I've used um, revocable transfer on death deeds. You know, I typically, you know, my typical estate plan would probably be a trust, you know, or a will. Um, but in certain limited cases, the, the RTODD has been a good tool. Um, and I just wonder the more layers that get added to this, the less useful of a tool it's going to be um, for everybody. And, and I don't know where that balance is. Um, and I think Texcom is, is in just trying to point out, you know, that, that there are these concerns about publication and, um, and, and just making sure, just, just trying to bring up the idea that um, maybe things are getting further and further away from this very simple tool. Um, would you agree with Brian's comment that witnessing would be the least burdensome of all these options? I believe so, you know, and I, I do believe that, that it's consistent. You know, some of the comments from Texcom members have, have been that the burden should be at the front end um, versus, um, or the protection should be at the front end versus the back end. Um, and, I, and I think that witnessing is at the front end, you know, and um, witnessing would provide for, um, you know, testimony um, post death, which is a concern if there's just a notary. Um, you know, it it would be the only deed that would require a witness. You know, so having that having that difference there um, might lead to some confusion. Um, on the other hand, there's there's a form. Right, so we have a statutory form for the RTODD, which is gonna have the witnessing, you know, language in it. Um, so I think on, on the level of burdens, um, probably witnessing is probably the least burdensome um, of the three. Um, okay. Am I right in um, assuming that then you would want witnessing in conjunction with notarization, that you wouldn't want one to be dispensed of at the expense Right. So, well, I think that there's there's a 
law that requires any recorded document, any Correct. recorded deed uh, to be notarized. And, and, and so the law would have to be amended to dispense of the notarization requirement to allow the RTODD that's just been witnessed and not notarized. That law would have to be amended to allow that deed to be recorded. Um, Texcom would, um, would recommend not eliminating the notarization requirement. So if, if the commission is going to add witnessing or recommend adding witnessing, um, that it would be in conjunction with notarization as well. Yeah, I mean, I've done estate planning in my practice, and I'm, I guess I have to amend my biography. I'm a member of the Stanislaus County Estate Planning Council. And having had clients have documents notarized, they take that very, very seriously because it feels very official to them. And so I actually would concur with your position. I don't have an opposition to witnessing, but I think that if you did both, um, it would be a very good bulwark against some of the fraud concerns. You'd have witnesses. You'd have something that is feels very official to the person executing the document as well as the document. And I personally would would feel well, that would typically, be typically if I mean I know that that these deeds are designed to be used by lay people, maybe without the advice of an attorney. But um, in any case where I'm doing an estate plan, it's going to involve a will. You know, if, if it's going to be a trust, it'll have a will that goes with it. Um, so there's going to be witnessing required. There's going to be, there's, there's pe people are used to doing witnessing um, in a law firm. Um, mm -hmm. I might be concerned with witnessing outside of a law firm. Um, the concern that if it's a witness that has a beneficial interest um, in, the, in, the, in the deed itself um, might pose an issue. There's some warning language, I think, in the frequently asked questions um, that alert to that issue. Um, but there could be some mistakes that are made, and whether those mistakes would cause cause problems, you know, is unknown. But you know, that, that's a concern. Leads to a presumption, which right. can be overcome, but that means it's you're in court. It's not right. non-probate anymore. Right. Right. Yeah, well, I recognize that having witnessing of deeds is somewhat unusual. I, I can't help but think back to the fact that our state has lots of multi-ethnic populations and I would feel more comforted by the fact that there were witnesses because there just may be outright misrepresentation to someone who's not familiar with the language as to what's being signed and the notary will merely say well you have the right driver's license but that doesn't go to the core of the uh, actual transaction so I would be inclined uh, your, your points are very well taken uh, having been at the September meeting the only reason we went for publication was because we recognized that no one knew how to contact all the heirs so obviously the moment we cross that line and go after heirs it opens up a huge number of things to do and and thank you for pointing that out but um, my two cents and I guess we'll get to it when we vote on this but uh, would be to both have notarization at when and witnessing but because besides the multi-ethnic issues um, you know senior fraud is rampant it's just rampant and with the aging baby po boomer population I think it would be worthwhile to make sure that these transactions are witnessed I have a question for you. Have you have, do you know if there's ever going to be an evolution in terms of publication that involves social media? You know, I don't. Um, I haven't. Um, Just wondering if you're like your your group is talking about the opportunity or. Because I would imagine just like now the courts are starting to become paperless, you know, that's got to be one of the next waves of change for publication. A question for the California News Publishers Association. Yeah. They're the yeah. ones with. The but even they're going online. Yeah. yeah. I know that that uh, that we have a group that's looking at the electronic wills, um, you know, and, and some of the legislation on that. Um, but I don't think publication has been part of it. Because I would hope, honestly, because I am in favor of publication, that as the law does evolve to permit it, just like we can do notices of case management conferences or ex parte hearings by telephone or by you know whatever online using facebook or, or you're not facebook but you know email the it, reason i mentioned cnpa is because I, I think what you say has merit but we're not going to break that ground in this study that's a big political no no but i'm not saying in case or instead of i'm just saying that we should expand our minds to realize that in the area of publication it can become more available because like Jane you made a good point maybe in LA I've got five six different publications to rely on reasonably but if I'm in you know another county that's smaller 
maybe a good Facebook posts could do it. I don't know. Anyway. Yes. I, I think that um, one of the other considerations with regard to uh, publication in paper form rather than electronic form is that the that that it's been a um, source of income for the local papers and many of those papers are struggling now so no, you know I don't think we'll ever get rid of paper because I, I like paper too I, well, well I'm I, just I saying think, this I think the papers have been dwindling because they don't have the finances to keep going and that may put them over the edge so Brian are you looking for a vote on this global issue before we have any votes on the other issues. Yes, because if you decide to drop a particular fraud protection, then we don't have to talk about the technical issues. So for example, if we get rid of, if we keep notarization, then we don't have to talk about coordinating a lack of notarization with other statutes that require it as a prerequisite to recordation, that kind of thing. So yes, big picture questions first, then we'll have narrowed the scope of the technical ones. Uh oh, what? I lost track of what the big picture question was. So right now we're talking about should the statute require witnessing as in the draft? Should it require notice to heirs? Should it require publication of notice in a newspaper? Mr. Chair, uh, if, I can yes, make go a, ahead. if I can make a suggestion. Uh, me personally, uh, my view on this is that uh, I, I would require notarizing and witnessing, but I, I'm okay with dropping publication. I think I agree with Texcom's position that really what you're, the only thing you're going to accomplish with that is costing people money to occasionally catch the edge case of a pretermitted heir who manages to catch the notice in their daily newspaper, and I, I think that's going to be an outlier. So I hear three commissioners uh, in favor of notarization and witnessing, so do I hear a motion on that point? I'll make the motion. I think that both witnessing and notarization should be required for an ROTD. Do you have a second? We, uh, we got rid of the publication so fast. Well, 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 well uh, we, we've had a first and a second. We can have discussion now if you want to continue that discussion. I didn't hear you say you were getting rid of the publication. No. Didn't. That's not the motion. No, the yeah. motion was solely as to adding the witnessing requirement to the existing notarization. Oh, so, so you, you, we should actually remove the publication requirement and remove well that would be a separate separate, separate. got it okay sorry about that okay um, any discussion on the motion that's on the table to uh, to require witnessing in addition to notarization yes that's right uh, witnessing and notarization any discussion all those in favor say aye aye, aye. any opposed any abstentions seeing none um, do I hear a motion on the publication issue I would move to admit it Second, anyone? Second. All right, uh, we have a first and second. Any discussion, further discussion on that topic? No, and I'm just curious. So you guys are thinking that it's the publication, the burden is too great and it doesn't really capture anybody's attention. Right, I mean, we've been talking about it in terms of the Goldilocks problem. I mean, I, I think that that is excessively burdensome, especially for the, you know, the, the main purpose of this is to aid people who don't have a lot of money and sophistication in doing a simple transfer, it, it adds a significant inc incremental burden to them without really much in the way of fraud prevention. If you're already required to notify, you know, family members who are definitely potential heirs, then catching the edge case of a long lost cousin that you forgot about who happens to read the legal notices in his lo local paper, yeah. like that's, I, I'm not confident that that's going to happen a lot. Alan, I have just a background question. Do we know how common these tools are? In other words, thousands per year? Of the revocable transfer? Yes. That's it? No, we don't know. We don't have a you, I mean, that's part of the problem with the short time frame for this study, is these are private instruments. Um, the only official record of them is in the recorder's offices in the 58 <laughs> different counties. They don't have a unified database that I'm aware of. So we don't have empirical data yet on their frequency of use or of problems with their use. And regarding the publication, uh, initially when that recommendation was made, what was the thinking and rationale, if you can remind us? Um, I think that that was actually a suggestion that Assemblymember Chow made, if I remember, and it was in the context of a discussion of the the other protection that you haven't had a motion on yet, which is requiring a beneficiary as part of the process of acquiring title 
under an RTOD deed, requiring them to send notice to the deceased property owner's heirs, okay? An heir is a statutory term. Its definition can be complicated based on complicated family situations. Um, and there was some serious doubt about whether a lay person without advice of counsel could figure out who a decedent's heirs are. And so we built into the proposed statute a little bit of slack so that the, the deed wouldn't be invalidated by reasonable mistakes in giving notice to heirs. And I think at that point, Mr. Chow thought, well, let's require notice as a gap filler so that if the beneficiary reasonably makes some mistakes and doesn't send notice to people who actually should get it, you won't strike down the deed, you won't punish the person, we'll put the notice in as kind of a backstop. And the idea too is with the publication is, is like if you have a mother or you know retired people who hang out reading newspapers, they catch those notices. And it's very real, and the whole point is to try to preserve lay people's opportunities to devise their properties the way that they want to without the advice of counsel. So I think that if we ignore the fact that there are people who do like the newspaper and do read the newspaper, then we, I think we run the risk of courts having to spend time on whether or not it's valid or not, when you could just easily eliminate that question because you would have posted it or published it somewhere. Mr. Simpson, uh, I was just a question for Brian. Do we know in any of the other states where this instrument exists? I guess Arizona, I guess, was one, whether they have either the publication or the notice to heirs? I don't think they do. Uh, I, I haven't researched that specific question, but my recollection of um, the genesis of this study, when we looked at other states, I don't remember Nat Sterling having found any kind of uh, notice requirement or at all. Um, and Mr. Sterling went on to be a reporter for the U uh, Uniform Law Commission on the, the Uniform Act on revocable transfer on death deeds. And my recollection was that the Uniform Act, like the Commission's original proposal, was more of an enabling statute than a regulatory one. So it said, you can do this. You, and then left a lot of discretion to use individual users to draft their own instruments. Um, and I don't remember there being a lot of shackles on the process to protect against fraud. And I don't remember any kind of notice requirement. And, and maybe to honest question about um, any sense in those states where it exists, how frequently um, it's used? Oh, I don't know uh, how frequently it's used. I do, we looked at the appellate case law in those states and did not find a high frequency of problems being reported. Um, the, I would say one thing that your question prompts and the answer uh, makes me think is that the, the decision to add a publication requirement was tied fairly closely to the prior decision to require beneficiaries to give notice to heirs directly, to serve notice on them, and was sort of an adjunct to that. Mm -hmm. um, so it might make sense for the commission to think uh, more broadly right now about the whole concept of putting a responsibility on beneficiaries to give notices when the deed operates. But we can modify the motion to take care of both elimination of notice of sentence errors and publication. If that's the commission's will, yeah. Does anyone want to make a motion to eliminate both notice to descendants errors and publication? Do we still have uh, Commissioner Crow's motion pending? Yeah. So. Okay. Uh, I, I would expect oh. you have a motion on the floor. Okay, we, we, we could do them separately, I suppose, right, right. Okay, so, we do them separately. okay, all right, so all those in favor of eliminating publication, say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Aye. No. Or nay. Nay. One, so one nay. No vote from nay. Commissioner Miller O'Brien and, and Commissioner Kubas. Kubas. Thank you. Okay. No abstentions? Okay, the motion carries. Uh, I guess now we have to dot our I's and cross our T's, the final motion. Uh, do I hear a motion on eliminating notice to descendants' heirs? Yeah, uh, I think to uh, um, bring this to closure, we need now to vote on whether or not to eliminate a requirement to notify the heirs of the descendants. Direct, directly serve notice rather than publish notice. I'll make a motion just for discussion. Any seconds? 
Well, I can. I think the chair can second, right? Yeah. So, so uh, I'll go ahead and second that. Uh, uh, maybe we'll have an interesting discussion. Uh, I, again, going back to the last meeting, we all recognized the difficulty in finding errors. Uh, so, uh, but I, uh, those who want to have something to say about that, go ahead. Can I can I ask our friendly witness a question? Sure. Um, I, I I briefly looked at the. Um, the objections that you had, but maybe you could expand on on why related to this specific notice requirement, why you feel it's unduly burdensome and difficult for the average person to figure out. Well, I think one issue is the is the issue of who is an heir um, and and trying to identify um, who that who that class of uh, people are. Um, you know, I I think a lot of people have assumptions about. Um, what constitutes an heir under law, and there's um, a whole host of statutes with um, step, you know, step relatives, half half uh, relatives, adopted relatives um, that can complicate things, you know. And so the complication of um, who the heirs are, um, you know, and and again tying this back to it's a layperson, you know, hopefully that's uh, utilizing this. Um, and you know, putting putting the onus on them um, to identify that group, and then um, send the notice out. Um, you know, and I guess that's I guess it's it's that's that's the burden. You know. Yeah. If I could add uh, just little information, the the term heir is defined in the probate code, but it's defined as a person who has a right to property and in intestacy, intestate succession. So in order to figure out if somebody is an heir, you have to go and look at the statutory law on intestate succession. And there's a fairly complicated, not, not insurmountable, but complicated set of rules about who takes property in intestacy. And it's based on uh, familial relationships, but it's also based on um, contingencies, based on who is alive. Um, and so in order to determine heirship, you have to look at a decedent's family tree and evaluate uh, who's alive and what their relationship is to the decedent. Uh, not a big problem if you've got a lawyer and you're in court. Uh, a layperson wouldn't know where to look. Uh, it's, it's not as simple as saying a list of brothers, siblings, parents, grandparents. It's not that. You have to like follow a couple of steps through the statutes and then figure out how to, how to read and understand a statute that's drafted for lawyers. In, in my mind, this is uh, somewhat related to the concern about uh, the absence of a judicial counsel form at the moment. I mean, if, if this passes through the legislature, I, I would imagine the judicial counsel would get to work on such a form. But in, separate and apart from that or in parallel with that, I, I, I could foresee uh, you know, a few new pages in the NOLO press on how to do your own estate that accommodate this and you know provide the guidance that's necessary you know right. and and it, you know it's likely to to be as as you described a little more uh, complicated than just blast everybody in your family that you know of who's still alive and even the dead ones just in case um, so it will be a little more complicated than that but you know I mean people do their own divorces and sell their houses all the time often with the help of the forums and NOLA press books so, right and, and people do their own probates yeah. And um, there's there's you know, Nolo books on that have the family tree that Brian was talking about and show who the yeah. heirs might be. Yeah. Uh, so I I mean to me it strikes me as a, I mean it can be complicated. Some people will make mistakes, but it's that strikes me as a solvable problem. It might it might be helpful if I if I may just to refer to the statutory language we have on this. Um, it's in page 49 of the draft proposed section 5681. And the meat of it is starting at, at subdivision C um, in terms of figuring out who to give the notice to. It says, if the beneficiary has actual knowledge of a final judicial determina determination of heirship for the deceased transfer, or the beneficiary shall rely on that. So, I'm sorry, Barbara? Oh, okay. Um, shall rely on that determination. So if a court's already determined who the heirs are and you know that, you use that list and can rely on it. Otherwise, the beneficiary shall have discretion to make a good faith determination by any reasonable means of the heirs of the transferor. So we, like I said, we left the language kind of forgiving. Um, the beneficiary need not provide a copy of the notice to an heir who is known to the beneficiary but who cannot be located. 
after reasonable diligence or unknown to the beneficiary. So some reasonable excuses for unavailability or ignorance. Um, there's a form of notice in subdivision E. Uh, and then a little bit that was added for the first time in this draft have, having to do with multiple beneficiaries. If a revocable transfer on death deed names more than one beneficiary, only one of the beneficiaries is required to comply with the section. Um, and then this was something that I think Texcom had originally suggested, some sign of, kind of consequence. A beneficiary is liable to an heir of the transferor for any damage caused by a failure to comply with this section that is intentional or grossly negligent. So there is liability, but the standard's kind of high. And then it says, a beneficiary is not liable under this subdivision if that beneficiary reasonably relied in good faith on another beneficiary's statement that the other beneficiary would satisfy the requirements of this section. So if your brother says, I'm doing the notices and you have good reason to believe that they will, you don't face liability if they don't. Uh, Mr. Simpson was first and then Barbara. Actually, that helps. Okay. Um, as I was going to say, it sounded kind of like we um, made the wrong decision first because the, the publication of notice was intended to make the notification of errors a little less burdensome and, and you know, um, transparent. So, but um, this language that you just pointed out seems to me to make it not particularly burdensome and not going to create undue um, liability on the part of the beneficiary in terms of what this notification to heirs um, Dr. consists of. Yeah, Barbara. So I am looking at page 10 of the staff draft rec recommendation, which is the narrative discussion about the notice to heirs. And what strikes me, I, I, I thought I remembered this, but um, it, this requirement of notice to heirs isn't something that's brand new in this. It comes from a notice requirement in the trust context. So when a, a trust becomes irrevocable because the trustor dies, there's a requirement of written notice to the trustor's heirs. Um, and I guess that's P probate code section 16061.7A1. And uh, I don't know the details of that, but I assume it's, you know, you must have used that language when you were fashioning the, the language for the... Yeah, we modeled it after the trust laws requirements. The, the one thing I would point out is that a trustee is a fiduciary and they have the access to the trust estate, so they may be more likely to have counsel. Um, so it's maybe a little less likely that a trustee would be a lay person who was just flying solo um, than a beneficiary of an RTOD deed who really the requirements are pretty modest compared to the administration of a trust and there is no fiduciary duty. They're acting in their own interest. So is, is there a publication requirement with the, with the trust? No. Although as Texcom pointed out, there are publication requirements in the probate code. So when you open a probate, you're required to, to publish notice. And then the point of the RTODD is to avoid probate. So that's why we thought publication will take care of this issue because you may not catch all of the errors. And then if I can just point out that not everyone has families that are with the same parents and they've been intact forever. So you have multiple marriage issues so that you're not always aware of errors. Also, people have families that are not necessarily formalized by marriage, so there can be lots of issues with heirs and trying to capture those, and not everyone is aware of how to go on to the NOLO site and or to even read the FAQs completely. So that's probably why the judicial uh, or the judges also have a comment, too, to make sure that we do as much you know, work up front so that it doesn't become an issue later, later down the line. Uh, that's another reason why I know I was sitting next to Senator Chow. I was thrilled about the publication um, suggestion. Ms. Barvine, you had something? To echo what Mr. Simpson said. Reading the precise language of the statute and not generalities about what might happen or who <coughs> are, the statutory language is fairly forgiving and sets a pretty high bar. It's one beneficiary, so... Uh, but it sets a bar, I don't know what you're talking about, Crystal, but it sets a bar with respect to intentionality or 
gross negligence. And so it's not just we're holding them to this impossible standard to find every possible beneficiary. You won't be sanctioned unless you're a bad actor. I, and a lot of kinds of innocent mistakes would be forgiven. So reasonable, if you reasonably approach publication, and if you don't satisfy the bar, then who would be challenging it, especially if you were acting with the best intentions? It, it should not create an outlier situation. Ms. McAllister. I don't, I don't think they're mutually, I think the theory is how do you accomplish the notice to heirs, is what I'm hearing. So the, the I agree with Commissioner Boyvine in what she was expressing. So, so just because you don't do publication doesn't mean you automatically can't have notice to heirs. You can send someone a letter. You can have a conversation with someone that's your brother and a co you know, having a cup of coffee and go, oh, by the way, this thing is happening. It's less burdensome to a beneficiary than publication would be, in my personal opinion. So I don't think they have to, they have to go hand in hand. I think they can be mutually exclusive. Um, my two cents is that uh, uh, Texcom, the group of practitioners, has come here to ask us to make this as simple as possible. And I, I'm now convinced that the notice to heirs makes things more complicated. Yes, this is different than trusts, but you rightly point out that trusts are, have fiduciary responsibilities. Uh, trusts are usually handled more with legal guidance uh, because they hire lawyers to do trust for, for flat fees. Um, to, so if, since the practitioners are asking us to keep this simpler, I would want to stay with just witnessing and notarization. Um, again, uh, we're the California Law Revision Commission. Part of California is this incredibly wide, multi-ethnic, multi-desporic population. My father at 94 just died with 12 brothers and sisters scattered all over the wild wind. <laughs> China, Hong Kong, England, the United States. Um, and uh, for those reasons, I just don't think that notice to heirs, especially since the practitioners are coming to us and telling us they want this to be, the whole point is not to make this parallel to trust. The whole point is for this to make a simplified vehicle in lieu of trust and probate. And that's why I would advocate for only witnessing and notarization. Mm -hmm. But the motion on the table is to... I, I have two questions. I, 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 um, one is uh, maybe it, what would help me is if you could give me examples of how this instrument is currently used. And then I, from what I understood in the beginning of the conversation of this item is that we were concerned or there were concerns about fraud and abuse uh, of this instrument. And so if we take away the publication and if we take away the notice to heirs, what I'm wondering is what do you think are the safeguards that would be available? And maybe that's why I just need examples of how this instrument is currently used and then if you have ideas of safeguards that are not about publication or notice to it. So I can speak to my practice, um, how I've used the, the RTODD. Um, again, it, the way I'm using it is with the advice of counsel, right? So I don't have perspective of how a layperson might uh, utilize it. I have some ideas. But overall, I would imagine that lay people aren't maybe aren't as aware of these types of deeds as um, as attorneys maybe, just because they're new. Um, and um, as time goes on, more and more lay people um, will, will be aware of this opportunity. Um, so here in California, a probate is required um, currently um, when an estate exceeds $150,000. Um, if there's property, real property or cash or um, assets in the estate that don't have beneficiaries um, that are just part of someone's assets, part of you know, part of their estate, and um, a lot of estate planning is um, designed to make things as easy as possible for the surviving heirs, for the for the beneficiaries, and um, to make that process easier, um, a, a lot of effort is made to avoid probate, uh, which is uh, seen often as cost uh, costly takes a long time to, to get through. 
um, and and it's in court, right? And um, so a lot of effort is made to to avoid probate. Um, one option um, to avoid probate is to create a trust, right? And um, that's a very common option, and, and a lot of clients do that. Um, part of creating a trust, you know, it's 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 more than just creating the trust. You've got to create, you've got to fund the trust. You've got to do a deed transferring property into it, uh, transfer your you know accounts into it. So that way, when when you die, all the assets are in this trust entity, and then they can be administered after you die without going to court. Um, the trust, um, you know, it's a complicated document. It's, it's typically going to be, you know, upwards of 25, 35, 45 pages long, right? It's, 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 it's going to have some depth to it. Um, and where I've used the, R, the RTODD is in a very modest estate, right, where maybe the family is um, cash poor and house rich, right? Um, and it's a uh, it's a situation where they don't want to go the distance and pay to have a full blown trust prepared. Um, all we all we would be doing is putting the house in the trust, basically. Um, and so when I suggest to them that there's this option of this deed, um, it's it it's very attractive. Um, there really isn't another way. I mean, you can name beneficiaries of of an account at the bank. Right, you can you can say when I die, I want this account to go to my kids or my grandkids. Mm -hmm. But with property, there really isn't a way with without this RTODD to name a beneficiary, right? To pass that property without without probate. Um, so without the RTODD, if you don't want to go to court or or, or to put that property through uh, probate, you're looking at adding someone as a joint tenant to co-own the property with you. Which has its own problems, or you're looking at um, transferring the property outright to them, um, you know. And so the RTODD is a useful tool where where it can preserve ownership um, of the property with 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 the client, right, with the person that owns it. And and a lot of times a house is the person's most most valuable and precious asset, right? That's what they worked their whole life to purchase and pay off. Um, so with the RTODD, they can they can own that as long as they're alive, but still preserve that benefit of um, it passing automatically. Um, so it's a it's a it, it's a rare case, right? Um, and it's usually when a person's their 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 primary asset. What I'm worried about as an estate planner is the property. Um, other factors that might go into it is the complexity of the family, right? And um, you know, the RTODD doesn't allow for contingent beneficiaries, right? So, with a with a with a robust trust, with a robust estate plan, we can plan for all types of contingencies. Well, I want to give all my assets to my kids. Um, well, if if one of those kids isn't alive, I want the assets to go to their kids, and then or, or I want it to be diverted. Um, and if any of them is under a certain age, I want it to go into a trust for their benefit, you know, so we can get very creative um, with the trust. Our TODDs are, are much more limited. It's like an account at the bank where, where you're naming one person or a group of people without going beyond that. So that's going to be a factor that I look at. Um, and then just to clarify, uh, and based upon your experience, where would the issue of fraud and abuse come in? Is it that you can have a company come in and tell someone, look, you could sign this, and how, how does that work? How would you envision that if it were to happen? It would be probably along similar lines as, as, um, as any other type of fraudulent deed might come up. You know, it's um, if you had a gift deed or a person um, that's tricked into transferring their house to, you know, to someone, um, uh, I would envision it um, not not being in an attorney's office, but maybe it's at home, or maybe it's um, one of the children meeting with mom or dad and and sort of designing this plan, explaining to mom and dad how how it works, or misexplaining it. You know, um, <coughs> that, that's how I would I, I would I would see it come up, probably. Um, you know, and and, and I've I've really um, 
probably only done maybe less than five RTODDs total. Um, I've only had, in one case, I think the person's passed away. Um, and so I don't really have a lot of data points on what happens afterwards. Um, and, and, and really, it's, it's, it's a very narrow scope of, of what I see. I think I also heard you asking sort of about how it, how it works in practice, um, the process. And it might be helpful to just walk through that for new commissioners. Um, it's pretty simple. You, you have the form. You put down a property. To, you name your beneficiaries. You sign it and, for, and have it notarized. And then it, take it to the county recorder and get it recorded within a fixed number of days. Then it sits there doing nothing until you die. And then on your death, the named beneficiaries will go in and record a death certificate um, and maybe an affidavit of death. And at that point, by operation of law, they should have title. And they should be able to go to a title insurer if they want to sell the property or, or, or encumber it and have the title insurer look at that record and say, yes, you have good title. Um, a big part of this study was focused on making sure that title insurers could determine the validity of title totally from the county records without having to resort to any off-record information, because they won't. And at that point, they won't grant insurance, and then you have to go to court. Um, so you could easily have an elderly person of diminishing capacity and have a care custodian or a neighbor or a, rel a niece or a nephew come in with one of these things pre-filled out and, an, and a mobile notary, because uh, they do mobile notary service, and just say, remember we talked about this, please sign it, when they don't really understand what it is, and they take it away and record it, and nobody knows. Um, and they don't find out until that person dies and the property's gone. Uh, they can contest it at that point, if they even know it happened, um, before the time period runs for bringing the con an effective um, and that's the basis for the concern, is this is going to happen outside of the public eye and that there's a vulnerability there um, and that the horse will be out of the barn before anybody knows it's going on. Uh, that's why with the witnessing requirement, the idea is bring more people in at the inception to make sure that it's not a secret act. Um, and the notarization also serves a similar kind of function. Um, I think some bad actors might be intimidated by having their act occur in front of somebody who looks like an official. Um, and then on the back end, the idea of the notice was, before you actually perfect that title, tell all the other family members this is going on and the clock is running on complaining. Um, and that, that's where the risk of fraud was seen, I think, and how these protections were uh, seen by the commission as being an appropriate way to try and minimize those kinds of harms. Ms. Borvine. And I think the risk of fraud is a concern of the legislature as well. So I think if you pull out at least the basic notice requirements, you run the risk of impacting how this moves forward. Well, that's not existing law, just to be clear. Existing law doesn't require the benefit. No, I understand that. I understand. Yeah. yeah, that's what I'm saying. If you decide you're not going to include that, yeah. a pull out was the wrong word. But Texcom, you're not concerned with that. Not concerned with the so, um, I, I, you guys practice in this field, so you know they're making good points that the possibility of fraud is going to be much higher if you don't notify heirs. But in unbalance, you, you're not that concerned about that. Well, Victor, I would just well, say that they're attorneys also. Right. And I think that may be, you know, I mean, the, the, the class of cases that we're looking at involve attorneys, right? They, they involve us. Um, we haven't really seen a lot of activity of, you know, contest yet, right? Um, notably, though, other types of property, other types of at-death transfers don't require any kind of notice, right? So we have... Um, a joint tenancy property. Um, you can name a beneficiary of an account worth $5 million. Um, you could add someone to an account, and none of those things require any sort of notice after someone dies. Um, so this would be a, this would be a, 
unique feature um, to these types of deeds to you know require this notice. And so it's it's the question, I guess, is what makes these types of deeds unique enough to warrant the notice versus those other types of you know at death transfers that don't. Mr. Simpson, and I'm not too concerned about that, but um, it, it strikes me that kind of following up on what Diane was saying that part of this conversation is is driven by the legislature and I guess the judges view that with this um, kind of um, do-it-yourself um, uh, transfer of assets upon death, um, you want to make sure that there isn't some kind of errors and fraud going on and and witnesses do that and it strikes me that the notification of errors isn't so much about whether you can find them all but it's about the person the beneficiary um, knowing that I better not, I have this affirmative obligation to tell other people about it so I better not screw up or I better not um, you know um, Swindle or what, whatever to make make some. Um, it's it's the uh, making that um, uh, making it less likely that somebody's going to actually try to pull a fast one because they have an affirmative obligation to notify people. So that and I think the way um, Brian has drafted it strikes me it doesn't seem unduly burdensome. And and, and you know, as Diane and Brian were saying, the 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 consequences for forgetting somebody or it has to be negligent or 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 grossly whatever the other word is yeah um so that isn't it's it's to be a deterrent i think for someone being a bad actor about it and it strikes me that that seems fine barbara i just um since i mean people were talking about how does this work in practice i thought i would share that i um my father passed away in nevada and he had done a transfer on death deed in Nevada on his house there. <laughs> um, we did have to go through a probate proceeding for some of his assets. Um, with regard to the transfer on death deed, um, we did not have to obviously go through a probate proceeding. It was some time after his death before our attorney eventually got to the point of uh, recording the uh, transfer on his his the, the proof of his death and and making the transfer pos possible, um, and, and I can say that you know we did not wind up selling the place until after the probate proceeding had closed, which was a, a substantial amount of time. Um, throughout that time. There were expenses associated with maintaining the property, um, and those were just going out the door. And that's you know that that's what the advantage is of of a transfer on death deed. We weren't we did not sell the property, but we did have the ability to sell the property. Um, and so I, I just thought I'd share that perspective. I don't know whether there was a formal legal requirement to notify heirs of my father's death. Um, it was just my sister and me, and we both knew, so it was, it, that part was simple and straightforward, but I thought I'd just share the, the experience. Any further discussion? Okay, the, the publication has already been eliminated, so the motion on the table is all those in favor of eliminating the requirement to notify uh, decedents heirs say aye. Aye. I'll be one. Aye. <laughs> All those opposed? No. Uh, any abstentions? Okay. Uh, the motion is defeated. That was a very spirited discussion. We don't always have. <laughs> <laughs> no. No. That's why I just said no. <laughs> <laughs> it's not we had some good ones during mediation confidentiality. We have some good, no, we, we definitely have some topics that are discussion and a long discussion. It's often the case that the issues are narrower 
um, this called for sort of a broadening out and making some big picture decisions. And, and so I think the conversation was more freewheeling um, than if we were talking about the sort of thing we're about to talk about now, uh, which is having made that decision, that takes uh, some stuff off the table, but there are still some technical issues that need to be. So uh, by retaining the provision that requires beneficiaries to give notice to transferors, Texcom made a suggestion that the content of that notice be supplemented, expanded, to include a warning about the time limit for filing a contest. So not just this happened, the person died, there is a deed, I will be taking title, but add language saying, and this is how much time you have left to act if you have a problem with that. Um, I, I wasn't able to draft language in the time period I had available uh, because it's gonna be a little bit complicated. It's more complicated than the rules for trusts. Um, but the question is, um, do you want to add language of that type, telling them about the, the time to bring a contest to action? Get Texcom to write it for us. <laughs> I'll write it. <laughs> Just trying to save you the work. Yeah. Um, I mean, I guess the... They would say, you need to hire an attorney. <laughs> we, we would, I think, make that language statutory boilerplate, specified mm -hmm. language, so rather than requiring lay people to figure it out and express it in their own words. It'd be like a block that has to be included in the notice. Um, the, uh, the only downside I see to it is, you know, the perception that you're inviting litigation. Mm -hmm. You're like rattling everyone's cages and saying, yeah, you know, your brother's getting this, but maybe you could find a way out of that if you bring a lawsuit. And I don't know, I mean, you, you pointed out, I think that in the trust law, the notice includes this kind of language that you have this amount of time yes. to contest the trust. And apparently it's not a problem in that context. So I raise that not because I endorse that view, but just because it's the only problem that I can see with doing this. I'm okay with including it. Yeah, I, I would think it would make it even more um, apparent in the context if we're dealing with lay people, it gives them that much more information to assist them in whether they're going to undertake a contest or not. It, I, I would be in favor of including it. Okay, do I get a motion to include language? Is that what you're to looking To add language add. warning of the time period available for a contest. <laughs> Second. Oh, there wasn't a first, was it? Oh, so moved. I thought it was a motion. Okay. Oh. No, that was a motion. Okay. I'm meditating on it. <laughs> a motion. It will, I will make the motion. Okay. And it's seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? No abstentions. Okay. Well, hold on. Yeah, I'm going to oh, abstain oh, I'm on sorry. That one. I, I'm sorry. You are fast. I, I'm just got, trying to get us to lunch. Okay. That's, what the chair, <laughs> that's what the chair does. <laughs> okay. Um, now, the Texcom suggested also adding some further information, but in the context of the publication notice, but I construe that to be relevant to the notice to heirs too. So I raise it, even though it wasn't specifically in that context. You suggested adding the date of the decedent's death and the date of execution of the RTOD deed. Um, pretty easy to do that. Uh, do you wanna add those requirements to the notice? Just to, I make a motion we end, if I may do so through the chair. Just to clarify the comments that uh, we made on those two items were related to publication. Right. Um, because the notice requirements in the RTODD statute require that a copy of the death certificate be sent ah. with the notice. <laughs> and that a copy of the RTODD be sent. You are correct. Yeah. I withdraw my suggestion. Um, they're already getting that information mm -hmm. through the inclusion of those two documents. I'll withdraw the motion. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Um, can I say one more thing? Do no. you need a motion? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Go ahead. Um, you know, I don't know whether it's feasible at this time, um, but you know, but I think Texcom's view is is that the more standardized this this can be made into, the better. You know, so the more forms that are part of the statute, the better. If it's people, that way those forms can be published by whomever and they can get them off the internet and it's, it's going to be concise. So I don't know if this notice at some point can, can be 
converted into a more of a form that's this is the notice um, for you know, you know right now it's a it's a it's a statement substantially in the form of, of that's you know listed and that gives some flexibility which is nice um, but I think the more standardized in in some ways the better it's I think it's a, a good suggestion yeah. uh, require a little drafting this has been framed in terms of specifying necessary content but the law already has a statutory form for the deeds and for revocation. We could make a stat this into a statutory form. I think that's a great suggestion. Yeah, why don't you go ahead and draft that, okay? And then we'll vote on it later after it's drafted. Well, no, we'll, we'll get to that. I kind of envision like maybe there could be a pack in, not to put you guys out of work, but maybe someone could go to like the probate office and get uh, like, you know, like for family law, how they have for the divorce packets. This could be a, a packet for considering what to do if you have someone on their deathbed who needs to devise their property. Yeah, that, that's good. Thanks. So I'm gonna run through some things that are described in the memo that I uh, could probably have been consent items, but I didn't expressly make them. So I'm gonna do it fairly quickly and people should raise objections if they have any. And then we can get to the, the big ultimate decision. Um, one thing is, as I discuss in the memo, the general approach under the probate code is that changes to the probate code apply retroactively except in specified circumstances. I think there are enough substantive changes here to the process that it would to make them apply retroactively. Uh, and then rather than try and parse through all the changes and say, well, these ones can be retroactive, but these ones cannot, uh, my recommendation was that there be a global statement that the changes that are made pursuant to our recommendation be prospective only. I agree. Okay. Yeah, we also heard from like the title insurers, they didn't want anything, you know. A very technical thing that I, in the original draft, I had. Uh, drafted a repeal of section existing section 5676 and the addition of a new section 5676 which differed in substance I had second thoughts about the wisdom of recycling the section number I thought it might be confusing with respect to references and cases or whatever so I changed the the added section to 5677 so that it doesn't duplicate it okay consent item good oh no the bell <laughs> sorry <laughs> Must be lunchtime. <laughs> um, I added language in the notice requirement, which we've retained to address the possibility of multiple beneficiaries. I already previewed that. Uh, the rule says only one of the beneficiaries needs to give the required notice. You don't have to have duplicate notice. Uh, and then the other says that the, the sanction for failure to give notice applies to all beneficiaries except for those who reasonably relied on representations of other mm -hmm. beneficiaries that they were taking care of it. Okay? Mm -hmm. um, there, there's a provision in existing law that deals with uh, conflicting instruments. What happens if you have a RTOD deed and another, like a trust or another instrument that purports to dispose of the same property? I'm not revisiting the substance of that provision, but there was a technical drafting issue raised, I think, by Texcom originally, uh, which some of those rules depend on whether the other instrument is a revocable instrument. And Texcom pointed out that these rules are only going to apply after the transferors died. It was your point? Okay. So at the time of after the transferor's death none of these instruments are revocable so to talk about a revocable instrument is confusing at least to lawyers uh, and so we proposed in a prior draft i think in the tentative recommendation to change the language to refer to an instrument well an instrument that is revocable during life and when i looked at that as i was drafting this final draft i thought well that's kind of ambiguous too because it might be construed to mean revocable at any point during your life. Uh, so I used language that I've seen before that talks about this kind of situation that says revocable just prior to death. Oh, right. Yeah. What's the time frame? <laughs> it's, I don't know, we could. Second? Second. Second. Yeah, that's <laughs> I, as I've seen that language in other statutes, I've always construed it to mean 
the, 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 essentially the last measurable moment before so death. Right but like, up to the point of, yeah. of no longer being able to. So at death, but not at death. Mr. Carrillo? I, don't. I didn't research that. Um, I could certainly do that and confirm that the language is unproblematic and, and standard. Um, and your, your, your read of it is eminently reasonable, but um, having experience in the insurance context with the definition of the word sudden, uh, which caused literally decades of yeah. litigation. And there is statutory law on what is meant by simultaneous. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so un unless there's a definitive Cal Supreme Court opinion defining that, I think we're creating an ambiguity. Okay. Um, let me put a pin in that. It sounds to me like the consensus is let's look harder at the language before we put it into the recommendation. That it made it just as ambiguous as the prior language. Yeah. Okay. Um, the last point I wanted to power through here is a, a really technical one, which is that at a prior meeting, the commission that they wanted to add a citation, a cross-reference into the comment to a section to highlight the governing statute, the statutory limitations period for a particular kind of action. They said, okay, we're, let's put that cross-reference to that limitations period in, in the comment. And when I went to draft that, I found that it was in the statute itself. There's an express reference to that, mm -hmm. to that provision in the statute itself that I overlooked when the commission made that decision, or I would have said, no need. Um, so my conclusion was no need, and I, I did not include a cross-reference in the comment. So big picture is to approve a final recommendation subject to the decisions that you made today. And as anticipated, a couple of those decisions require drafting. Um, we're up against the deadline for submission of this report to the legislature. So there's two ways we can accommodate that. One is we could schedule a meeting between now and January 1 to come back and evaluate the language that I come up with. The other is uh, something we've done many times in the past when we're up against the time limit, which is you delegate the drafting to the staff subject to approval of the chair. So this is, a, this is technical language. There's no policy decisions that are going to be made. I could do the drafting, show it to Commissioner King, and then he could confirm that it implements the commission's decisions, and then we would go forward from there. Having just stepped down as chair, and how many times did we do that, that last go around? Like three times. It works pretty effectively. Um, so, I mean, I would be in favor of that in order to expedite it. As, as just one commissioner, I'd be inclined to let you go forward in the way you describe and have you include that process. We need the motion, right? The motion to approve the recommendation subject to the decisions made at this meeting with the understanding that staff will draft implementing language as necessary to be approved by the chair. I'll make that motion. Second. All those approved say aye. Well, no discussion? Okay. All those approved say aye. 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 Any opposition? Any abstentions? Okay. Um, shall we break for lunch? Uh, time to return at 1. Are we going somewhere? Uh, I did not make arrangements for her to go anywhere. Right, time, uh, 1 o'clock? I will be reconvening at 1 o'clock. Thank you very much. The basement? Uh, it's 1 o'clock. We're going to reconvene for the afternoon session. First up is the California Public Records Act cleanup uh, memorandum 57 and 58. Okay, I'd like to start. We have a witness um, from the County of Santa Clara who's here today. I'd like to start by inviting her to join us up at the witness table and introducing herself. Welcome. Anywhere, yeah. <laughs> it's all yours. <laughs> And so if you just introduce yourself quickly to the commission. Hi, I'm Jenny Trice, uh, program manager. Um, I'm here on behalf of the county council's office of Santa Clara County. So um, we, okay. It, it's okay. We, uh, we'll get to your comments um, after we go through some preliminary things, if that's all right. 
Of course. Okay. So there are essentially four pieces of paper to consider today. Um, there is Memorandum 2019-57, which pre presents a draft of a final recommendation proposing to recodify the California Public Records Act. Um, there is a supplement to that memorandum that presents and analyzes the comments from the County of Santa Clara that was distributed electronically um, just a couple days ago. Um, there is also a separate memorandum discussing the comments on the separate tentative recommendation that consisted of conforming revisions for the proposed recodification of the, the California Public Records Act. Um, that um, memorandum includes the narrative portion of the draft recommendation relating to the conforming revisions. Uh, it does not include the proposed legislation itself because that was so bulky. That's in the supplement. Um, this is what it looks like in hard copy form. Uh, there's another hard copy over there if, if it's necessary for anybody to refer to it. Um, we didn't distribute hard copies because we didn't think that would be necessary uh, and tried to save a few trees. Um, so that's, those are the documents that are under consideration. Um, as directed by the legislature in 2016, uh, the commission has been preparing a non-substantive recodification of the California Public Records Act to try and make it more uh, readily understandable and uh, basically better organized and user friendly. Uh, the commission approved a tentative recommendation on the topic earlier this year uh, after more than two years of studying the topic. Uh, and pursuant to the commission's longstanding practice, that tentative recommendation was widely circulated for comment. The commission considered the comments in September, uh, made a whole bunch of decisions in September. And uh, so the staff, since the September meeting, has implemented those decisions in the draft recommendation that's attached to Memorandum 2019-57. And we also made some other revisions which are discussed in the memorandum. Um, at the bottom line question for the commission with regard to this memorandum will be whether to approve a final recommendation uh, for publication and submission to the legislature, uh, either with or without res uh, revisions, um, in hopes that the legislation could be introduced in the legislature this coming year. Uh, if the commission does not approve a final recommendation at this <coughs> It would not be impossible for the legislation to be introduced in the coming year, but it would be very hard, um, give, especially given the bulk of the um, legislation involved. Um, so uh, before we get to that bottom line decision, uh, there's sort of a number of preliminary decisions uh, for the commission to make along the way. Uh, the first decision point, relates to the decisions that the uh, commission made in September and the implementation of those decisions. Um, for the most part, uh, that work, uh, there was a lot of work involved in implementing those decisions, but for the most part, it was pretty mechanical because the uh, instructions that the commission gave in September were precise. Um, in a few instances, uh, there were some situations where the staff wound up uh, doing some drafting. Those are discussed in the memo at pages two and three. Uh, and really the, the first question for the commission is whether the, anybody has any concerns about any of those revisions to implement the decision <coughs> in the September meeting. No. Seems to be no comments. Okay. All right. Well, then the second question, um, the uh, other main thing that the commission staff had to do following the um, 
September meeting was that the, the legislative session ended, the governor's time to act on the bills came and went, um, and it was necessary to take a look at what happened to the Public Records Act in the 2019 legislative session. Uh, the bills affecting the act, there were a number of them. They're listed on pages three and four of the, of the memo. Um, in general, again, it was pretty mechanical about how to incorporate uh, the revisions from 2019 into the commission's proposed recodification. Um, the, there are, we inserted uh, notes into the uh, recodification explaining about the, the recent legislation so that if anybody had any questions about how come this doesn't read the same way as it does in you know, their 2019 volume of the codes, um, you know, they would understand that there had been a, a bill that changed the law and that the proposed recodification took that into account. Um, there were a few places where their there staff did have to exercise some discretion, uh, a language in the reco proposed recodification that would uh, uh, continue provisions that were just enacted this past year, uh, they're described on page four of the memo, and the question is, you know, does anybody have any concerns about those drafting decisions? Seems to be no comments. Okay. Um, and then the California Public Records Act also includes an index uh, of exemptions, an alphabetical index of exemptions that are located uh, in, it, it includes an index that's all exemptions in theory. Um, it, it makes clear that, that if it doesn't happen to be, if an exemption doesn't happen to be listed, that doesn't um, mean that it's not valid. It just means that the, the, the index is purely a tool for users. It has no substantive effect, but it is designed to help people using the California Public Records Act. Um, it, ha it lists hundreds of code provisions that create exemptions to the California Public Records Act. Um, and it was... Quick question on that one. Um, does It points to other places in the law or not, or to the Public Records Act for what exemptions are? It points to both places, both to exemptions that are in the California Public Records Act and to exemptions that are located elsewhere in the codes. And is that updated for statutes that were enacted in 2019? <laughs> That's what I'm just talking about is that in our proposed recodification, yes, um, we are making revisions to the commission's proposed recodification to account for 2019 legislation in, in one respect only though, um, the current index is not complete. Every, in, in theory, every two years, a legislative committee is supposed to um, update the index. In practice, that hasn't been happening that often. Um, the commission previously talked about should it try in the context of this particular study on recodifying the Public Records Act, should it make an effort to make, uh, make the index complete? And the commission decided no, that would slow down this study, it would complicate the study, and it might not, even though the index is purely a user tool, some people might perceive that as being more substantive in nature than, than just a pure recodification. So the, the commission has not, with respect to the index, not tried to add things to the index. What the commission has done with respect to the index is for the entries that are already in it, some of those provisions have been repealed some of them have been revised in ways that no longer make them relevant to the Public Records Act. Though some of them um, provisions have been moved to another location within the codes, 
those kind of changes, we have um, made corrections to account for them, um, not just with respect to 2019, but with respect to the entire index. Mm -hmm. um, so um, what's described here on pages five and six of the memo is the changes that we had to make to the proposed recodification, uh, to the index in the re proposed recodification to account for 2019 uh, legislation. But we did not, again, we did not try to add the new provisions that create new exemptions to the index. Okay. There, there seem to be quite a lot of those. Yeah, I, and the, I the, had one of them. Okay, and the idea is that um, that might be appropriate for another study, but it was not something that the commission wanted to take on in this study. Got it, okay, thank you. Uh, Barbara? Yes. I don't wanna, first of all, two years is a significant period of time to allocate for this study, and obviously an enormous amount of effort has already gone into it. And I don't want to do anything or say anything that would slow that process. I would ask, though, if are there any areas, because we were not present for the discussions, being that we're new to the commission, which were and still could be identifiable as areas that potentially could involve or deserve, I should say, additional consideration. And that does not in any way suggest that we shouldn't go forward today to do what we should do, whatever that will be with this document. But I'm wondering, in the process of going through this very big, difficult task, a big task, were there areas that were identified that perhaps raised certain areas that were controversial in any fashion, which could be identified now that we should be thinking about? Is that a, and again, I'm not asking for a reprise of every of your efforts and those of the commission and what they did. In the context of this particular study, which is strictly non-substantive in nature, I think that the commission has already covered the ground. With respect to, um, are there areas of the Public Records Act that the legislature might want to give attention to, I mean, obviously lots of it. And some of it has already, you know, there are things that the commission identified in its proposed report here that, um, you know, that, that might be things that the legislature might want to look at. Um, things like uh, government code section 6254F is the long provision on uh, the law enforcement exemption to the Public Records Act. It is very long and complicated, and the language is, could could perhaps be cleaned up to make it, um, you know, more readily understandable and workable. But it's not something that the commission could do because it's um, there's too much danger of a substantive um, kind of concern. It would, if the commission attempted to do that kind of reform in this study, it could jeopardize the entire reform. Um, so we can feel comfortable within the scope of the <clears throat> work that was done. We have done a sufficient job and a thorough job of looking at the provisions as they exist to make the changes that needed to be made as we see them in this current document. Uh, that's my sense is that the commission has has done what the legislature asked it Thank to you. do Thank you. in this study. If I could just add one uh, point of information. It, when we've done these kinds of projects that are recodifications that are uh, designed to be entirely technical, we sometimes will prepare an appendix to our report where we note for the legislature's attention issues that we spotted that would require substantive change to address. And so they're beyond the scope of our assignment. And we have done that in this study. So uh, near the end of this very lengthy document, there's what we've denominated Appendix B that has just a, a short list of things that we thought were beyond the scope of our authorized work, but 
would probably benefit from future attention. Um, I think we were fairly cautious in preparing that list. We didn't try to wrestle with any of the key controversies within the CPRA itself. So there's, there's still fairly technical concerns, but they are, and addressing them would have been a little beyond what, what we could do. Thank you. So the, the question here on page six of the memo, and this is, is a question about the revisions that the staff made to deal with the 2019 legislation affecting provisions listed in the CPRA index. And the question is whether those revisions are okay. And I know that the County of Santa Clara has concerns about the structure of the index in general. Um, that's not within the scope of this question. This is just a more the mechanical revisions that were made to deal with um, the 2019 legislative developments. Are those acceptable to the commission? We'll see no comments. Oh, okay. Uh, it looks like there's consensus that's acceptable. Okay, and then the next point is that the staff made various other revisions in the course of preparing the draft recommendation. They, these were, you know, formatting changes, correcting typographical errors, correcting various technical errors of one kind or another. Not anything uh, of, of, I think, real interest to the commission. There, there were a few places where the staff exercised a little more discretion. Those are listed on page seven. Um, and does anybody have any concerns about any of those revisions? There seem to be no comments. Okay, so that takes us out of the main memo and into the supplement, which discusses the comments from the County of Santa Clara. Um, most of those comments were supportive, and that was very helpful. Um, and But I don't think we need to really go into the details of that part. Um, the, the rest of the uh, comments from the County of Santa Clara had to do with the um, index to the CPRA. And maybe I should just uh, give you the floor and you can describe your, the county's concerns about that point. Okay, I'm just very brief. Um, basically, like she said, we, um, we do support the project, all the work that you've been doing and commend the commission um, for all the work and effort put in so far. Um, as provided in the letter submitted on November 12, 2019, we urge the commission to create the index subject-based rather than alphabetical base. Um, creating an alphabetical base index will make it difficult to search for specific exemptions as you are required to really know what you're looking for um, in order to find it within the alphabet. Um, a subject-based index will be beneficial to attorneys statewide, um, providing efficiencies that save, money, uh, save many attorney hours. And so um, basically we appreciate your consideration of this and look forward and welcome any future um, conversations. Um, so I honestly I don't use I'm not a lawyer either so I don't use the index um, regularly or at all um, <laughs> but uh, Subject base, uh, my, inter my understanding is, so if you're looking for something that's uh, for a criminal investigation, uh, related to a criminal investigation, it would be everything related to criminal investigation would be under that subject rather than just alphabetical with whatever title it had. It, it wasn't. That's just my understanding. <laughs> we had discussed as a possibility when we were first looking at the index. Right now it's strictly alphabetical based on some sort of little squibs on what the subject matter is. Um, and so we had considered the possibility of reordering the index so that you'd have health, criminal, you know, law enforcement, um, you know, whatever. They have articles for each subject and then have an alphabetical list within the article, something like that. Yeah, you'd have to have duplication. And, we're trying to be realistic with this legislative calendar. So, so we we had an example of um, 
redrafting the index, not the entire thing, but an example of, of what a subject matter index would look like. Um, and then, you know, the commissioners could compare it to the existing index um, and the vote, which was a like a three to two vote, so a, a close vote, but the commission decided to stick with the alphabetical approach um, for purposes of this study. Um, one possibility that the commission could consider it at this point is perhaps revisiting that decision in a separate study. If you were going to do a separate study of uh, bringing the uh, CPRA index up to date anyway, you could consider it at, in connection with that. But I, I can say quite firmly that if the commission today decided that as part of this proposed recodification, you want to switch to a subject matter based index, uh, we could not do that in time to introduce the legislation this year. It would involve too much work. And, um, and, and aside from the staff doing the work, then it would require an opportunity for uh, both stakeholders and the commissioners to see what had been done. And, and so I, I just don't realistically think that if you want to complete the study in time for introduction this coming year, um, I don't see how you can switch approaches now, which is not to say that you shouldn't consider the approach that, that the County of Santa Clara is, is uh, advocating, but just that uh, in the context of this particular study, um, you may want to decide to go forward uh, without uh, changing the approach now. So I'm comfortable with the approach that we took. I appreciate what you're saying. Um, and I'm comfortable with sticking with that approach as a long-term prospect for the index. As a drafting matter, I think it might be difficult. Even if, you, Barbara, as good as you are, you go through and you do it, and then you have to deal with duplicate entries. I think maintaining it beyond that would prove to be a little bit more problematic. So from my perspective, I like the way it is, and I would want to retain it in the alphabetical listing. No, I, I liked it too, Barbara. I looked at it and um, I, I kind of a little bit shared with her that it, it looks good to me the way that it is. I don't, I'm not familiar with uh, using the CPRA, but I, I kind of like what we've done to it. Um, why are you guys looking like that? Oh. Yeah, and then I think Tom was too, and then we've had other practitioners just for the benefit of you guys that um, have come to the meeting and just, and we've gotten letters that have said basically just kind of leave things the way that they are. There are a couple of thousand attorneys who will be mourning the death of 6250 and 6254 because <laughs> we've been citing it every day of our lives for the last uh, 20 years. Uh, and and uh, changing the index uh, and reorganizing, I think, was just a bridge too far, just too many changes all at once. So, and there's time to do it in the future, perhaps. But but I'm more than satisfied with the alphabetical. I agree. I, Commissioner Boyvine's comments well taken in terms of future indexing. I think that would be really challenging. And might re no one wants to trigger another study if we don't have to, right? So... And, and also, too, I think we talked about it being involving some substantive changes, too, because uh, reordering it might require, you know, maybe you look at it as the health code, but maybe I'm looking at it, well, that's, you know, medicine. So it, there's just some issues with it. And I think we fleshed them all out over the years. So it's more than just leave it alone because we've already done this, <laughs> you know, which you, anybody should push back on. So is there a motion? So you're seeking a motion to adopt this draft of the uh, recommendation of the uh, California Public Records Act cleanup. Uh, yeah, I guess we can do it that way since, uh, unless you want to have a separate motion on the index issue. Oh, no, 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 okay. no. No approved as is. I'll second. All right, um, any discussion? 
All those who want to issue this recommendation say aye. 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 All those opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you very much, Barbara. That was a oh, lot of work. Got another one. You're welcome back. You, you didn't get beat up. It's not personal. <laughs> no, we, we've still got the other recommendation on the conforming revisions. Yeah, uh, turning now to Memo 58. So this one is a consent item, um, and I want to modify that to one extent. Um, we have a our long <coughs> Uh, Vicki Matias uh, has been proofreading this document. She's about halfway through. Um, she's working for us as a retirement, a retired annuitant now. And she spotted an error in existing law, a typ typographical error in, um, this is Business and Professions Code 9882.6. Um, it's uh, subdivision B2, the last sentence says, in, a, in existing law, it says, these expenses may paid out of the Consumer Affairs Fund established pursuant to Section 204. And it should be may be paid out of the Consumer Affairs Fund established pursuant to Section 204. So um, I would uh, suggest that we... Uh, correct that in the uh, final uh, in the draft recommendation and also note the correction in the accompanying comment and with that uh, revision I would ask whether you approve the um, fine a uh, draft recommendation consisting of conforming revisions could I ask one favor could you send that to me separately in the event that the legislature doesn't want to take on this huge draft in a second year and we could pick it up in code maintenance. The error. The error. In the event that the could legislature. Send it to me separately so we could pick it up in code maintenance in the event this bill doesn't go through in the second year of a session. Okay. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> so do we have a vote on that? So you're looking for a motion on approving these conforming revisions, including this new issue regarding the business and professional scope? Yes. Yes. So moved. Second. Okay, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? No, any discussions? None. Okay, thank you very much. So let me just interject briefly. Uh, Commissioner Simpson, you asked this morning if the conversation we had had about the de revocable transfer on debt deeds was typical. And I said, no, um, it really depends on the character of the work that we're looking at. Um, something like this that's purely technical, the conversation is, is yeah. much more muted. Thank you. <laughs> Next on the agenda, um, recodification of the toxic substance statutes, beginning with memo 59. Thank you. So I've, there are three memos related to this topic. Um, I'm going to take a few minutes to describe this study and just sort of set up what this study is all about and where we are in this study before I get into the memos. Um, the other thing I was going to mention is I, I may have said earlier that one of the DTSC staffers, he was expecting to be able to be here today. I got an email that unfortunately he had to, was held back at the office, so he was unable to be here, and, but they don't have any comments to provide today. So, All right. So... In this study, we were directed by the legislature in 2018 to uh, non-substantively recodify two chapters of a division of the Health and Safety Code. And this division of the Health and Safety Code is a mis miscellaneous division, so it has a real mismatch of different things in um, that division. But the two chapters that we were looking at relate to hazardous waste and hazardous substances, and those are kind of the terms of art that they use. Um, but these particular chapters, um, as I mentioned, they're located in this miscellaneous division. One of the things that we've been, we looked at early on is whether to move them out of that miscellaneous division and put them in a new location. So what we're going to do is we are going to move those chapters out of the miscellaneous division. We're proposing a new location to place those chapters. Um, we decided to proceed with one of those chapters first. It was sort of the smaller piece of law, we thought it was a good idea to jump into that 
area and sort of get familiar with this area of the law generally before taking on the much larger um, piece. And we've slowly been over time building, based on an organization that was approved by the commission, a new, uh, it's a part of a new division that will hold what was previously in this chapter. And so this law relates to essentially cleanups of th hazardous things that have spilled in the world. Um, and I'm gonna jump to memo 2019-61 is the cumulative draft. That shows all of the provisions that we've, the commission has considered to date and has approved for inclusion in the tentative recommendation. So those things are all things that the commission has seen before. Um, there's no decision to be made on that memo, but we're <laughs> nearing the end. The other two memos actually cover the final pieces in that, um, they're gonna be in that new part. Memo 2019-59 and 2019-60. Um, so after we complete the work today, just to sort of give a sense of what we'll be doing next, we will have completed, completed a draft of the proposed legislation for this first chapter. Early on, the commission decided that they wanted to move ahead with recodifying the chapters individually. So we'll be preparing a tentative recommendation. We'll have to write a, the narrative part, and then we'll be bringing that back for the commission's consideration, which it would then be released for public comment before we finalize that recommendation. So the memorandum 2019-59 presents a draft of the final chapters um, in this recodification. And they're chapters 10, 11, and 12. Um, the first part of the memo is sort of formulaic. It describes our drafting practices for this study. So one of the things that we've done in this study is we've stuck very closely to the existing language of the law, but we've kind of moved pieces of it around. Um, so we've broken apart large sections. When the section wasn't really thematically related, we would move pieces of the section to different areas where they sort of fit more nicely with the material surrounding it. Um, after the description of the drafting approach, the memo provides a discussion of how the chapters that are presented here are organized. So it lists the different articles that are in those chapters. The chapters relate to a financial assistance program for people who are cleaning up uh, brownfields and underutilized properties. So properties that are could be commercially viable and uh, have economic use, but are contaminated with hazardous substances. Um, the second, is about an environmental insurance program related to such properties. And the last is a compensation program for people to be compensated who've been harmed by hazardous substances. So in accordance with the commission's prior direction in this study, there's a few drafting issues that are presented there and those are presumed consent items. Otherwise, the only decision for the commission in connection with this memo is whether or not you approve the attached draft for incorporation into the proposed legislation for the tentative recommendation but I'm happy to take any questions about the study and the status, if there are any. <clears throat> there appear to be no questions. So, so I, to, <coughs> to, approve it. Uh, to approve the draft, please. Any discussion? All those in favor of approving this draft, say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, motion carries. Okay, and then the next memo, memo 2019-60, presents a few miscellaneous provisions. As we were going through and building this uh, new law, there were a few sections that we were unsure where the proper location was. Now that we've got a more complete draft, we were able to place those. So this memo includes proposed legislation placing two sections um, into the, the recodified law. The memo describes what the sections are about. Um, it includes, there was one uh, drafting change that we made in one of the sections that was a very long defined term. This is described on page two that we shortened for um, ease of reading and to uh, make it easier to maintain consistency throughout the law. There are a lot of minor discrepancies in the use of this term. So we were able to kind of standardize that. But otherwise, on this memo as well, the only thing is a decision on approval of the attached draft and then 
that's all that's all I've got. So if there are any questions about it, I'm happy to answer those. I, I had one question. Uh, when I was reading through on page two, I was reading through where you had shortened the defined term to professional services. And so I, I guess I wanted to have a little more clarification on professional services. Is that assuming that is a, a licensure? You're working with licensed people? Is there a, is there a defined uh, term of professional services in the code that, that we yeah, so on page two of the staff draft, it actually shows where this would show up in the proposed law. And the, the definition of the term specifies that it is professional services of an engineering, architectural, environmental, landscape architectural, for construction management, or construction project management, all of those terms that were previously in the short form. Okay. Okay, I guess when I was reading the memo, my uh, maybe that's just my mind just went to it was a complete substitute for, so I was um, unclear on that. Thanks. Okay. Any other questions? Well, just to follow up on the question you asked, it might be helpful to point out that, to our knowledge, professional services is not itself a term of art that's used okay. in the, in this body of law. Okay. It's a our invention to serve as a shorthand for okay. this catalog. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so you're seeking a motion to approve the recodification of health and safety 25358.6.1 and 25367. Yes. So moved. So, well, those was second, right? Okay, any further discussion? <clears throat> All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? None. All right, and that's all I have on that item. Thank you, commissioners. Very good. Thank you. I think we're in the home stretch here. Uh, eminent domain memorandum 50. So you should have three documents here uh, titled memorandum 2019-50, and then a first supplement. Memorandum 2019-50 and a second supplement to Memorandum 2019-50. Um, first, just a brief review of what this uh, study is about, um, which is a small part of California <coughs> domain law. In general, eminent domain law authorizes a public entity under specified conditions to acquire private property for public use in a process which is known as condemnation. This study is about a part of that law uh, that involves pre-condemnation activity. This is activity in which the public entity is uh, investigating whether or not it wants to acquire private property and seeks permission to enter that property to do testing uh, to see whether the property is appropriate to be acquired. Um, this commission actually recommended the statutory eminent domain law to the legislature back in 1974. Uh, it included uh, some provisions relating to pre-condemnation activity. And uh, that pre-condemnation statute <coughs> authorizes the entity to comply with certain conditions and then go in and do this various testing. Now, apparently for quite some time, the pre-condemnation statute was not a problem because there's almost no appellate authority that discusses any of the, any of the provisions, at least until um, about, I don't know, 2008 or a little before 2008. And this part is not in the memo, but just for background for the, for the new commissioners, uh, the Department of Water Resources uh, started investigating the feasibility of building uh, tunnels to send water from the Delta down to Southern California. This was gonna be a major, major project and it was gonna impact several landowners. Uh, so uh, the department sought permission to enter uh, these separate properties to go in and do environmental and geologic testing on the, on the properties. Uh, and uh, in some cases to do at least what some of the owners thought was fairly significant testing. Uh, so uh, they got together, uh, a bunch of owners got together and uh, challenged this activity. Um, and one of the claims was that the pre-condemnation statute as written 
was unconstitutional. There is a provision in the California Constitution called the Takings Clause, which relates to eminent domain, and it, it speaks more simply about what's involved, but it has some requirements which would supersede any statute, and the contention was, one of the contentions anyway, was that the statute did not comply with the constitutional provision. Uh, the case went all the way to the California Supreme Court, and this is still before any activity had started. It was, it was brought sort of antici in anticipation of this, that part of the procedure involves going to a court and asking for permission to go in and enter. And so the court consolidated all these uh, petitions, and then they began litigating this before there was actually any entry. The California Supreme Court looked at all the issues and looked at the constitutional provision and ultimately said that the pre-condemnation statute was constitutional, complied with constitution if, if the statute was understood to include a jury trial for any owner who was damaged by any of the activity that went on there that happened to their property. The constitutional provision provides for jury trial. The statute was basically silent about that. So the California Supreme Court said, we will find the procedure to be constitutional, but we are judicially reforming uh, the procedure to include a jury trial for uh, owners. Um, judicial reform is kind of an unusual doctrine. It doesn't, it doesn't actually make a change to the wording of the statute. I mean, it, effectively it does if you read the decision in conjunction with the statute. But the commission thought after this decision that it might be a good idea to actually revise the statutory language to uh, reflect this judicial reform by the Supreme Court. So that was the start of this study, which initially was supposed to be uh, a rather limited study. Um, the first task that the commission undertook was to consider a statutory revision to the language of the statutory procedure to conform to the judicial revision. Um, we sought public comment on that. Uh, we, got, we had some tentative language. In response to our requested comment, we, we got comment on another issue, which is what's discussed in the first and second supplement, and I'll get to that in a little bit. But so staying here with the, in the order of the, in the order of the memos, uh, the, the the main memo here um, continues a discussion of how to best revise the statutory language to reflect the judicial reform by the California Supreme Court. Now, I apologize to the for to to the commission for this, but partly based on the timing of these memos, I realized when I was preparing that uh, the memo. The main memo does not set forth the entirety of the language of the pre-condemnation statute we're talking about. So you can see that if you look at the first supplement and you look at page two, the, the code section we're talking about is section 1245.060. Uh, and you can see when you look at it that, it, that subdivision A talks about um, I mean, this is all about compensation to the owner, but the first part talks about if there is damage caused by the entry or the activities, actual damage or substantial interference. It goes on to say, at near the end of that subdivision, the owner may recover for such damage or interference in the civil action, meaning they can sue, or by application of the court under subdivision C. And subdivision C of the section is the section that the Supreme Court judicially reformed. Subdivision C says, if funds are on deposit under this article, and there's another provision in the article that calls for the, the prospective condemnor to deposit an amount of money that they believe may be what would be needed to compensate the owner, that, well, you can read the rest of it. The court determines and shall award the amount the owner is entitled to recover under the section and then order that to be paid out of the funds on deposit. So nothing in here about a jury trial. So the commission 
wanted to add the right to a jury trial to this subdivision. And so now if we go back to the main memo, you can see, and this would be on, and I'm sorry to make you look at two documents at the same time, but if you look at page two, uh, second half of the page under the section says codification of property reserve. By the way, property reserve is the name of the Supreme Court decision. Uh, this was the language the commission initially came up with. We were going to add this sentence to subdivision C. In a proceeding under this subdivision, the owner has the option of obtaining a jury trial on the amount of compensation for actual damage to or substantial interference with the possession or use of the property. And that uh, roughly paralleled what the Supreme Court had said when they were describing what they were doing when they made the judicial reform. But uh, when the staff took another uh, look at it, um, the staff thought that perhaps it would be better for the statute to more precisely reflect and parallel the constitutional provision because that's the whole point is for the statute to conform to the constitutional provision. Uh, and so the staff has suggested uh, a slight change in that language which appears in the middle of page three. Um, the, the strikeout and the underscore would be a change to the language that the commission had uh, settled on initially. It does two things. It adds um, reference to the right to a jury trial rather than talking about an option uh, because that's of some significance. There's case law interpreting this constitutional provision that says the owner has a right to a jury trial. And uh, it also incorporates the concept of waiver. Um, so, and that, that also is in the constitutional provision. Sorry. Okay. Oh. okay. <laughs> I you were... So, um, this is all this first main memo is about: is a staff proposal to tweak the language that would be in the sentence added to Subdivision C to better reflect the judicial reform ordered by the Supreme Court. This is not the meatiest issue that we have to discuss, but this is the first issue. Um, Questions, comments, thoughts about this? So you need a vote on that, Steve? That would be great, sure. And I would just add that, you know, the purpose of tweaking the language to more closely conform to the Constitution rather than the descriptive language in the court's opinion came out of a concern that, you know, there might be doctrinal implications based on using the word option rather than right or uh, waiver. Um, so the, just out of caution, we're suggesting more closely hewing to the constitutional language. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor of making the changes that set forth on page three of this memo, say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Any abstentions? Seeing none. Everyone is still here. No one got up. Okay. All right, so now uh, we move to the first and second supplements, which both address a new issue, uh, the same issue. And this, this came about because, um, as I said, when we uh, asked for public comment on that revision that we just decided on, we got some additional comment on a different issue. Um, the Department of Water Resources said, you know, the, uh, the statute does not speak about any process really involving this compensation to the owner. And the issue of whether an owner would be entitled to make uh, a request for what was referred to as interim compensation. In other words, multiple, they could come to, and to the court multiple times during the course of the pre-condemnation activity. Each time they had a, a claimed harm, they could come to the court and ask to get paid for it, or whether they had to wait until the activity was finished and then come to the court and then seek their compensation. So uh, the, uh, the, and the, the department was urging that there not be any interim compensation allowed. Um, sorry, just lost my notes here for a little bit. So the commission talked about it and uh, made a 
provisional decision to revise the statute to uh, clarify that it did not provide for interim compensation. Uh, the thinking was mostly was based on practical considerations, uh, the need to have to potentially relitigate issues, the fact that there could be have to be multiple investigation of, of harm, the fact that um, sometimes the harm might be mitigated or cured by the entity during the course of the activity. In other words, uh, a hole gets drilled to do some testing, but then it gets filled in, so it would be a waste of everybody's time to then have the owner come in and ask for compensation when it was when the thing was going to be cured. But in any event, that was uh, the thinking of the commission. Um, well, we then submitted the, I mean, the decision goes into our, our minutes, and then we were contacted by one of the plaintiff's attorneys from Property Reserve, an attorney named Jerry Houlihan. And he has submitted both initially an email, which was the subject of the first supplement, and then a longer letter, which is the subject of the second supplement. And he urges the commission to reconsider that decision uh, for three different reasons. Uh, I reordered them um, for purposes of this discussion. Uh, the first reason is that he believes that precluding this interim compensation would violate the California Constitution. This takings clause that we talked about, at least as that clause is interpreted, was interpreted by the California Supreme Court in this property reserve decision. He also contends <coughs> Interim compensation was precluded. Uh, that would be unconstitutional under the federal constitution. Uh, there's also a takings clause in the United States Constitution, and that contention by Mr. Houlihan is based on uh, a newly decided United States Supreme Court decision, Nick v. Township of Scott, which came after the commission had made its decision, uh, and it has to do with that has to do with more with sort of um, eminent domain law in general. Uh, and then thirdly, he has suggested both in his email and in his later letter a number of practical considerations that he thinks points pretty strongly to it not being a good idea to preclude interim compensation. Well, um, I'm going to put aside the second and third arguments, unless, for now anyway, unless someone has questions or comments. The staff is not sure about the merit of the argument about the federal constitutional claim, and the practical considerations may cut either way, but the staff was fairly strongly persuaded that his first argument, that um, precluding interim compensation expressly would violate the California Constitutional Takings Clause. And I will go into that and explain that in more detail now. I have a suggestion as to what he might be talking about on the issue you don't want to cover, which is the U.S. constitutional issue. Um, so for whatever it's worth, I think he's reading Nick to say that, um, I mean, it pretty clearly does say that you have to exhaust state remedies first. And I think his argument is that if there is no state remedy to be exhausted, that that's contrary to Nick, and it's either a procedural or a substantive due process violation, or both potentially. So, so I think he reads it as Nick requires there to be the state remedy exhaustion, which then requires there to be a state remedy to be exhausted. And if he's correct in reading California's scheme as not providing that remedy, in one of these scenarios, it violates Nick, or it's at least contrary to Nick. I, I don't know if I buy that, but that's how I, I read his argument. All right, well, we, we certainly, I don't mean to say that I don't want to talk about that argument. I'm happy to talk about it. It's just that if the commission is persuaded that the first argument is sufficient reason to uh, reverse its decision, then we yeah. don't need to get beyond that. No, I agree with you. I, I don't want to derail it, but like. Oh, well, thank you. We, we may not get to that point, but. Like, for whatever it's worth, that's how I read his point. Okay. So, thank you. So, um, key to Mr. Houlihan's argument that precluding interim compensation would violate the California Constitution. Uh, so, we can turn now. So, let's, let's go to the 
I guess the second supplement now, because this is where most of my discussion will be. Um, you want to go to uh, page four, near the bottom. This is the California Takings Clause. It begins with private property may be taken or damaged for public use and only when just compensation is certain by a jury unless waived. That's, this is the Takings Clause. It has two sentences. The Supreme Court says that the second sentence is a limited exception to the first sentence. And the Supreme Court, when it found this pre-condemnation statutory procedure to be constitutional, found that it complied with the second sentence. And it went through what's required by the second sentence and said this procedure meets all these requirements. One of these requirements is that, this is in the next to the last line, that the procedure will provide for a prompt release to the owner of money determined by the court to be the probable amount. Mr. Houlihan's argument um, is that if you were to preclude interim compensation, you would then be denying the owner this prompt release, which would then make the procedure unconstitutional. Now, so we know that the procedure as written, the Supreme Court just said the procedure as written is constitutional. And if the procedure provides for interim compensation, even if it expressly provided for it, that would also seem to be constitutional because that would seem like a prompt release, the idea that you could go in and get money as soon as you had harm. It is possible that the procedure could comply with this constitutional provision and still not allow interim compensation. Uh, we, the, the staff offered two possibilities that how that might be true. Um, one would be that when the Supreme Court said that the procedure provides for prompt release, they were just referring to the fact that it's not a lawsuit. A lawsuit takes a long time. Remember in subdivision A, it says the owner can sue to get compensation or can use this deposit procedure. So maybe what the Supreme Court was saying was, and they don't explain anymore in their opinion what they meant by a prompt release. But maybe what they were saying was, see, there's a procedure here where you can go in and get money out of a deposit. And that's prompter than it would be if you had to sue, so we're fine. Or maybe the Supreme Court was considering the entire pre-condemnation activity to be sort of a single thing, like a, this one um, a procedure that can't be, couldn't be differentiated. And so in other words, you got money promptly after it was done. That's what the procedure says. And so that makes it prompt. Um, but Mr. Houlihan is, has uh, indicated that he has familiarity with two cases where condemnation, pre-condemnation activity lasted six years or seven years. And he's also pointed out cases in which a client of his has had pretty clear harm that was never going to be remedied, a cow that was killed, or a business that had to be closed. And so to the staff, if you combine those two things, if you had an extended period of pre-condemnation activity, years long, and you had harm that happened early on in the process, and the owner then tried to get compensation and was told, sorry, you have to wait until we're done, which could be years from now, that it would be relatively easy to persuade an appellate court reviewing that claim that that was not a prompt release of compensation and therefore was unconstitutional, making the, the statute would be unconstitutional. Just Mr. Simpson, um, I get all that. Um, what is it about the proposed statutory language that Mr. Houlihan thinks precludes interim compensation? Nothing right now. But, but, but the commission considered and had decided provisionally that it was going to rewrite the statute mm -hmm. to say you could not get interim compensation. Can you tell us why? Yeah. What was the thinking on that? 
Well, the thinking was, uh, it, it had mostly to do with practical considerations. We had the, the Department of Water Resources representatives were here and were explaining to us that normally this activity doesn't take very long. Uh, and we have some commissioners who have some familiarity with this and the notion that a, a, an owner could come in repetitively and make multiple claims would require multiple investigations and potentially there would be overlapping issues that would have to be relitigated more than once. Um, and I, you know, any commissioner who uh, was supporting this might also offer. Yeah, I, I, I don't think this was dispositive, but I was sharing my experience very early in my career when I was a condemnation attorney uh, working on the red line on the Metro Rail project in Los Angeles. And you'd have all sorts of pre-condemnation claims of all sorts of wild imaginary damages. And, and Victor uh, and I both worked on that, the rail project. Uh, uh, so so you know, there's this presumption that uh, I guess this uh, person wrote to Mr. Houlihan has that, that these claims will be earnest and uh, documentable. And my experience is in the pre-condemnation stage, uh, the claims are claims. You know, people claim that they had a restaurant that was disrupted in front of their business when there may not be a restaurant license, but they put a card table outside and four folding chairs and then make a claim for for loss of restaurant revenues. And that's a very specific example that, yeah. that I experienced. So uh, it all be, it'd be nice in a perfect world if people made sincere and documentable claims. But at a pre-condemnation stage, people make all sorts of claims. And if those claims turn out not to be valid, well, there's an enormous cost to having to uh, um, prove that and then claw back money that you may have paid out in pre-condemnation uh, interim damages. So it just seems to me, and this was just a personal view, but, but the commission, commission voted uh, to bar interim compensation. Yeah, it's in, there's also another, like if with smoke, I think most of us are familiar with if they're doing construction, then there's gonna be dust, and then maybe the plan is after they finish a phase and they're gonna wa you know, power wash or clean it. So the agency might already, or the condemnor might already have a plan in place to address pre-condemnation uh, pre issues. So we just felt like, um, but I, I do think that we didn't intend to rule it out. Yeah, I, 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 when I read it, I was thinking, I don't think we said get rid of it. We just said that the statute itself already addresses well, I, it. I, I, th I think that the uh, public agency person said there are other remedies yeah. that, uh, that, 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 they, that frequently out of goodwill and, and whatnot, they set aside monies. They're, they're more than willing to pay pre-combination damages, but to authorize a statutory procedure for someone to keep coming in and holding their hand out <clears throat> is a recipe for abuse. Well, there's, so there's, there's three possibilities here. There is, you know, my reading, or the staff's reading of the decision of the commission was to indicate in the statute affirmatively that there could be no, there could be no claim for interim compensation. However, what the commission did say was that a commission comment should be added to the, to the statute. This is a comment that the commission makes which, which further explains the intention of the language that this does not meant to preclude any informal, you know, resolution between the parties that would result in compensation, which is what the department said often happens, that if an owner has a legitimate claim, they just bring it to the department, the department just pays them, or they just, they settle it informally. And Steve, that was, I think, the point, is that the DWP manages condemnation or pre-condemnation claims differently than Metro or whatever other agency. So that's why I think we the comment was to address or to not to interfere with local agencies management of those pro usually a county will have it, you know, LA County has its own statute that borrow that relies on the constitution that says within 90 days you have to bring a claim. Um, for Department of Transportation it may be 108 or 20 days. I mean they all have different rules based on, you know, based on the different agency that's managing the project. Well, so with regard to, to Commissioner King's point, the, I don't think there's any problem with the statute as it reads, and I don't think Mr. Houlihan has any problem with the statute as it reads. The His problem is if you take out the, the prompt release. 
No, well, no, let's, uh, let's, let's separate this out. So the prompt release language is in the constitutional provision. The statute doesn't address anything about prompt or not prompt or interim compensation or not. That's the problem. <laughs> the problem is the statute, and this is the subdivision C, which, which you need to look at, is that it doesn't really provide any process. And so right now, Mr. Houlihan, he actually didn't, he never said, I've been able to get interim compensation all the time. I go to court and nobody has any problem. Well, he didn't say that, but he, he did offer that. He has on occasion in his cases, he has gone to the department and he thinks the threat of being able to make the interim compensation claim was enough to make them pay. Now, they might have just paid because they wanted to pay and they thought it was appropriate and they didn't want to have to litigate it. But in any event, if we did nothing to the statute, I don't think we have a problem here. Mr. Houlihan doesn't have a beef with that. He understands, and actually the staff understood, that the proposal was that we were going to add language to subdivision C that affirmatively precluded this interim compensation so that you would not be able to, to do this. Uh, and again, the comment would say you can still informally work things out, but that was, that's why we're talking about this now, is because that's the staff's understanding of the commission's previous decision was to revise subdivision C to preclude interim compensation. If the commission is fine, and that's what the staff's recommendation is here in these supplements, is to neither add it or, nor uh, and just leave it the way it is, uh, that leaves the court the opportunity to, they have some flexibility. And in a case where it seemed ridiculous to have multiple claims, the court could on its own, as a matter of a judicial discretion, could perhaps tell the parties, no, look, you need to consolidate, you need to wait, it's not timely, whatever. And in a case where it's clear hardship and there is a situation like Mr. Houlihan talked about, then maybe the court would allow that because it wouldn't be precluded. I'm just being funny. I, I think I told you guys so. <laughs> Mr. Simpson. She voted no. I'm thinking silence is golden. Yeah, I'd leave it as is. I, I think to further as an addendum. Mr. Rubin. I think we'd be going through a process here which could be made moot by the fact that if there's a constitutional challenge to this whole process in the future, which is quite probable, we will have gone through an exercise that in the end is not going to change anything. So I, I would agree here that we would keep the status quo and so what I, I can tell. And so I want, I want to just add one and, and that would make a little it bit more, a little bit more meat to this. This is, this, it's likely that th this will be of some significance because what happened in property reserve is that after the Supreme Court decided that the procedure was constitutional, it remanded the, the matter back to the Court of Appeal. Again, remember the activity had not yet started. It remanded it back to have that court consider more issues that had not been addressed by the Supreme Court, including whether the parties are allowed to engage in discovery with regard to the pre-condemnation activity. And that court said, yes, they are. So it's really, at this point, it's, it's somewhat unclear how this is going to work, but theoretically, you could have, if you allowed interim compensation, you could have parties engaging in discovery for each claim of harm and then have a jury trial for each claim of harm, uh, which could be a major mess for sure. Uh, and again, something that it seems like perhaps the court should have, the trial court in the first instance should have the authority to try and decide how to best. But, but, and I also just wanted to let you know that as best as I understand it from just brief reading, it looks like this tunnel project is still going. Um, it's narrowed, it's downsized somewhat now yeah. to a single tunnel, but, um, I'm imagining that there's going to be more investigation and there's the same thing is going to happen again where they're going to attempt to do the pre-condemnation activity uh, maybe in a smaller number of properties. So, if tunnel a project or no, pre-condemnation will continue to happen. Well. Um, and it sounded to me like the commission was getting close to a decision. Um, I heard a number of commissioners suggesting do not change the existing law on this issue and I didn't hear any commissioner taking a contrary view to that. Mr. Simpson. Yeah, I was, I was going to make that motion, and I think you had a question at the, at the end about do we say anything in the law about an interim compensation process, and I would suggest we don't. I agree. So my motion would be to, I guess, reverse the previous decision about affirmatively prohibiting it 
and um, be silent on what process that might be leaved up to the court. I'll second it. I would support that. Okay, uh, we have a first and second. Any further discussion? All those in favor of reversing the prior commission decision on this issue say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Any abstentions? None. All right. Are we done with the agenda? With the uh, Mr. Cohen, we want to thank you for your many years of service. I've been here for eight years with you. You've been through fish and game with us. Thousands and thousands of pages of fish and game. Wow. <laughs> but, any other, but many other studies. We've always enjoyed your hard work and your good cheer. And uh, we're jealous that you'll be going to the other c committee, the criminal committee. Uh, but if we don't see you for a little while, we wish you all the best. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Any other further matters before I adjourn? Okay, this meeting is adjourned. Oh, welcome, everybody. Yeah. <laughs>